Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, joining us from all over the world. I hope that you are all doing well. My name is Bilal Jamusi, Chief of the Study Groups Department in the Telecommunication Standardization Bureau of the ITU, and I will be co-hosting this event with my colleague, Walter Nisler, Chief of Section, Senior Economic Affairs Officer at UNECE. It is with great privilege we welcome you all to this year's Future Network Car Symposium, jointly organized by the ITU and UNECE. The symposium will be taking place virtually over four consecutive days from 22 to 25 March. We hope to reconvene next year at our usual venue, the Geneva International Motor Show. I see many participants connected today, and I look forward to your active participation during our discussion. I invite you to drop a quick message in the chat box with your name and the country from which you're connecting. We are privileged to have with us today His Excellency Holin Zhao, the Secretary General of the ITU, to give us his opening remarks. Mr. Zhao, please. Thank you very much, uh, Pilea. Uh, hello, everyone, and dear friends, dear colleagues. Welcome to this year's uh, Future Network Car Symposium. Let me start by thanking UNEC Executive Secretary, my dear friend Olga Agajarova, for her video message. And it's also my pleasure to welcome my very good friend, Jing Tot, the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Road Safety, who is joining us remotely. Together, we have impact on the UN Decade of Action for road safety and launched key projects like our AI for Road Safety Initiative. ITU, as a UN specialized agency for ICTs, aims to be a valuable partner to everyone innovating with the digital technologies, including the automotive and ICT industries and the many new market segment emerging at their intersection. ITU's membership includes the likes of Volkswagen Group, Hyundai, and Chang'an Automobile, as well as a diverse range of other automotive industry players, such as RootDB, China's Telematics Industry Application Alliance, Continental, Bush, Tata Communications, Mitsubishi Electric, Cubic Telecom, and Serons. All these players need common standards, whose development is one of ITU's core functions. ITU standards help deploy new technologies efficiently and at a scale. They provide for high quality and the high security communications in the intelligent transport context and the support ICT's growing contribution to road safety in areas from AI and the Internet of Things to vehicular multimedia. As we have seen during our World Telecommunications Standardization Assembly, which was held recently in Geneva, from 1st to 9th of March, ITU is committed to fostering a collaborative spirit among standards developers and the growing range of stakeholders in standardization. And even this morning, I received some standardization organizations, chief CEOs, and we talked about this kind of cooperation as well. Just last week, we hosted a meeting of the collaboration on ITS communication standards, where all standard bodies relevant to intelligent transport are represented. I encourage you to consult its database of all ITS standards able to support you. So when I talk about uh, ITS, it reminds me my old time, early time to work with uh, ISO, 
IEC experts together with ITU experts in 1990s to develop ITS common standards. At that moment, none of us, including myself, no, I'm secret general, supposed to be very visionary. We could not imagine how we could live today with this ITS system. It's already a reality. It's already much, much advanced and the technologies and uh, operations today really is beyond our imagining that moment. But we did start to work on this ITS system, myself also personally engaged in 1990s. This week, we will discuss our respective rules in ensuring that the new technologies lead to safer and a smarter mobility. We will explore the technical business and the regulatory actions required to leave no one behind, a central promise of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The split of collaboration and the consensus that a diverse international standardization is exactly the split needed to achieve the SDGs. So thank you to our generous sponsor, Chang'an Automobile, and thank you to our symposium moderator, uh, moderators, we have several, at <laughs> Ruth Shields, Roger Lamptot, Michelle Sina, and Ira Yang uh, Yanot. Of course, our major you know, spunk coordinator is uh, Ilya and, uh, and Walter. You know for our excellent program, as well as the many years of support that you have offered to this event. Uh, I have last word to, 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 to read, but before I read that last word, I also like to add a few more words. That uh, this uh, symposium actually started from time when I was a director of uh, TSB between 1999 and uh, 2006. I was a director of TSB for 80 years. At that moment, as I just mentioned, before that moment, I was already a senior uh, staff of uh, CCITT, engaged with ISO IEC on this ITS systems, the development of common standards. And then I realized that uh, we were soon moving to this uh, new era that uh, we will have uh, this uh, ITS become a reality so that uh, we uh, suggested to have uh, this kind of uh, symposium created. So I'm very pleased after I created this uh, symposium and uh, my successor, first is uh, Malcolm Johnson continued. And then later on is uh, uh, Dr. Chesap Lee continued so that uh, this uh, symposium already exists uh, for almost uh, two decades. And then we get uh, not only between ITU and the UNECE, we also get our special UN Secretary Special Envoy, Jane Todd, as uh, uh, you know, very important uh, players in our symposium. So that uh, uh, changes the, the picture, changes the scenario of our work uh, with much, much wide uh, you know, social economic influence. So that uh, I, I'm very pleased to see all this uh, development. And talking about uh, cooperation between ITU and uh, UNECE, that is not uh, starting from this symposium. In fact, we also started our cooperation in 1990s when we developed uh, the open office uh, uh, you know, um, standards that the uh, UNECE and ITU developed together in 1990s. And when we get uh, uh, this ITS to be uh, put on our agenda item, and then we naturally consider that uh, maybe UNECE could help us uh, to do these things much better. So that uh, we invited the UNECE, and I'm very pleased, you know, uh, over the last two decades, uh, we kept uh, this uh, uh, good cooperation between ITU and UNECE. And some of you may know that, uh, as I just mentioned to you, I already engaged with this business for almost uh, more than 30 years long. So the time is coming for me to move out from this uh, scenario, <laughs> from this uh, stage. So that uh, this might be my last uh, chance to talk to you as an ITU 
senior officials. And I talk to you as director of TSP. I talk to you as a deputy secretary general of ITU. And now I'm talking to you last time as the secretary general of ITU. So I wish you all good luck. And I do wish to see this cooperation continued to bring the benefit to everybody because this inter interregional transport system that autonomous driving and then the smart city, all this uh, we have come together to bring our life to different uh, level. So that I wish you all very successful meeting and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sao, ITU Secretary General for your inspiring words and for the continuous support in co-organizing the symposium uh, with UNEC. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now from my side, I'm Walter Nisler, Chief of Vehicle Regulations, Road Transport Safety and Transport Innovations Section at UNEC. And I'm looking forward to the 70th edition of the Symposium of the Future Networked Car. Let me remind all of you that to attend each day of this year's symposium, a separate registration is needed. So kindly make sure you are registered to each session for which you are planning to attend this week. We are planning to have with us today, Her Excellency Under Secretary General Olga Algareova, Executive Secretary of UNEC. Unfortunately, she is in Dakar and for technical reasons, she could not join with us live. But she sent a video message and I'm very pleased to ask the Secretariat to play her video message now. Thank you. Dear Secretary General, Hulin Zhao, International Telecommunication Union, UNSG Special Envoy for Road Safety, Jean Todt, colleagues and friends. Transport is key to provide access to work, health, education, and other public services. It also provides access to markets and supply chains for business. As such, it is essential for achieving social progress, including poverty alleviation and ultimately sustainable development. However, with the benefits of transport, we must also consider its externalities, which include, among others, the road safety crisis, the impact on air pollution, the impact on climate change, and the effects of congestion. Intelligent transport are part of the solution to address this. UNEC has taken a holistic approach to intelligent transport systems, looking into their application to the transport of dangerous goods, climate change mitigation, and smart roads. UNEC has been collaborating with ITU for almost a decade already in order to synergize the work of the automotive world and the telecommunication world. I reported last year in this forum on the latest developments at UNEC covering cybersecurity and software updates for road vehicles. A McKinsey report highlighted that this regulation will boost the automotive cybersecurity market to 10 billion US dollars by the end of the decade. I would like to take this opportunity to thank ITU and all our other stakeholders for their contribution for this seminal work. UNEC provides the regulatory framework for automatic driving systems. This includes the work done at multiple levels to address automated driving systems, supporting the safe deployment of automated vehicles in traffic. Tremendous efforts are made by our delegates to define the requirements for what I would call the driving license of automated vehicles and make sure that the artificial intelligence that powers these vehicles performs well. I reported last year on the adoption of the UN regulation of ALKS, which covers automated driving in traffic jam situations. Our work on automated vehicles continues. This year, UNEC will complete 
the drafting of guidelines for the safety of automated driving systems covering all kinds of vehicles and all use cases. At our symposium this year, we have gathered for the first time authorities at international, regional, national and local level to share their expertise and discuss together the shift towards more intelligent transport systems. It's only by working together with all stakeholders that we will achieve the synergies needed to successfully roll out intelligent transport solutions for sustainable development. I wish you an excellent symposium over the next four days. Thank you. We thank very much UNECE Executive Secretary for her remarks and for sending us a video message today. We're very pleased uh, of the excellent collaboration between ITU and UNECE in organizing this symposium and in setting international standards to support both automotive and telecom industries. Moving forward to our third dignitary today, I would like to welcome a very popular worldwide leader who is certainly known for all his success in the Formula One with Ferrari about 20 years ago, but who is today mostly known for his untiring dedication to enhance worldwide road safety. I'm honored to give the floor to Mr. Jean Todd, UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Road Safety. Mr. Todd. Thank you. Bilal, can you just uh, confirm that uh, the voice is fine before I can uh, yes, address sir. to you? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. So, dear uh, Secretary General of ITU, my good friend, uh, Ulin uh, Zhao, <clears throat> dear Olga Algriova, who unfortunately we could not uh, see in life because she is uh, in Dakar where incidentally I was uh, myself in Africa last week. <laughs> Ladies, uh, gentlemen, dear friends, I'm pleased to be with you today at the symposium of the future networked car organized by the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, and the UN Economic Commission for Europe, UNEC. As a special envoy to the Secretary General for Road Safety, I'm interested in what advantages technology and autonomous driving can offer to drivers, road systems, and also the environment. And I'm particularly interested in what they can do to propel the road safety agenda forward, especially in the most affected countries. Technology is an increasingly important component of mobility systems. And we know that putting safety at the heart of this technology and its deployment will optimize innovation and save life. We know very well that vehicle automation will not solve the road safety crisis because most of the fatalities happen in places where it is just not possible to deploy immediately. But automation can contribute as a solution in places with the required infrastructure in place if properly designed and regulated. In fact, as I was just saying, when I was in Abuja last week, the president's cabinet expressed great interest in investing in electric automated vehicles. It will be valuable to have a coordinated international approach to the development, testing, and rollout of automated driving technology, including contributions from developing countries like Nigeria. In that vein, we must be striving to reduce the road safety divide between developed and developing countries. The good news is that we observe that some regions of the world, such as Africa and the Asia region, are replying more and more on the work of UNECWP29 for updating their regulation and standards related to automotive product safety. If we agree that a coordinated international approach is the best way to achieve the highlights levels of safety within the shortest time frame and at the lowest cost for automation, then it is indeed WP29, which could be the forum. It could help develop specifications and evaluate new technologies as proven with the regulation on cybersecurity over the air 
updating and automated land keeping. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, in 2022, we are in the down of the second UN decade of action for road safety with ambitious targets, and we cannot fail to halve the number of road deaths and injuries <coughs> sorry, and to provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport system for all by 2030. We have the United Nations Road Safety Fund that is supporting work in all regions of the world. It is helping to implement the global plan for the new decade, which are clear priorities to utilize new technologies to solve our global road safety challenge. Setting the regulation and standard for autonomous driving and other life-saving technologies is therefore a crucial step on the long way to leave no one behind on the road. It is important that such features are mandated by regional or national legislations. But good legislation is one that can be proper enforced. Therefore, it is key that we bring on board all partners in the world chain, not only the high level policy maker, but also the administration and local authorities. And this starts with even simple elements, such as the use of safety belts. Also here, technologies such as reminders in cars to put on safety belts can support humans to make safe decisions. If we could utilize technology to influence every car passenger to buckle up, or every driver to not drink, drive, I'm assured we could make remarkable progress toward our targets. Let me tell you that I really count on all of you to make that happen. Thank you again to UNEC, ITU, and all partners for your contribution towards our vision of safer roads. I look forward to the solid commitments that will be announced around life-saving technologies during the UN high-level meeting for road safety, which is planned for summer 2022 in New York. I wish you a productive discussion, and I thank you for including me in your amazing presentation and program. Thank you. Thank you very much, UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Road Safety, to be with us today and to continue your terrific work and passionate support to road safety aiming at reducing fatalities and incidents and saving lives on our roads around the globe. I also wish to thank again Mr. Holin Sao, ITU Secretary General, and Ms. Olga Ogayarova, UNEC Executive Secretary, for their precious remarks. Today's opening ceremony is concluded. With no delay, I wish to invite the moderator of session one on the stage to kick off the first session of the symposium that will discuss government authorities coordination for automated driving and their intelligent transport. I'm pleased to give the floor to Mr. Jan Janold who leads the International Vehicle Standards Division within the UK Department for Transport to tell us about his first session. Thank you very much. Mr. Janold, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank, you very, Thank you very much, Walter. And uh, it was great to hear from uh, our senior visionary keynote speakers on their ideas and uh, sort of initiatives of how things are going forward. And I'm grateful to all of them for their words of encouragement in the work that we do. Um, so, uh, so as Valter has just said, I'm Ian Arnold from the UK Department for Transport in London. Um, I co-chair uh, the Intelligent Transport Systems Group within WP29. Um, and just for the sake of uh, clarity, so WP29 or Working Party 29 is the global forum for vehicle technical regulation within the UNECE based in Geneva. Um, now, as we all know, um, automation and assistance technologies are developing very quickly. Engineers and technologists are pushing the boundaries and creating exciting opportunities to improve our global transport networks. And we have to ensure that the great innovations can be implemented easily, 
providing manufacturers with markets, consumers with choice, while also ensuring safety and minimising the environmental impact of new road vehicles. And this requires thinking beyond just the vehicle, um, but also moving towards the road and network operators. And not just that, but also to regional and cross-border traffic, whilst also bearing in mind the importance of national solutions, um, whether they are at a national level or within cities and local authorities dealing with urban transport systems. And I'm pleased to say that we have a truly international lineup today for our first session. Um, and what I, I, I will introduce each of those as we go through in, in the kind of usual way. Um, what I would ask delegates to do is if you have a question relating to a particular speaker, can you put it in the Q&A section on the um, links? Um, and then we'll have a panel session at the end where we'll bring all six of our speakers together and hopefully be able to explore some of the issues that have been raised um, and answer any questions that you have. Um, but please make sure you put your questions in the chat function because I don't think you'll have access to all the audible um, contributions during the session. Now, um, our first speaker is Mr. Just van Tom. Um, Many of you will know Just. He's um, very experienced in this area. Um, he's the newly appointed Chief Executive Officer of Ertico ITS, based in Brussels. Um, he's a Belgian national with many, many years experience of legal and regulatory policy affairs. Um, he had a very senior role in ACEA up until his new appointment to Ertico. Um, He's had various appointments um, in the Belgium uh, Ministry of Economy, where he was an advisor or a member, rather, of the cabinet um, and also worked at one of the key um, strategy consultancy firms based in Brussels. Um, as I say, when he was at ACEA, he was director of Smart Mobility um, and he's been a good friend to the FNC events previously and also to WP29. Um, impressively, he's fluent in four languages and he holds various degrees um, in economics and business and in law and, and also was a teacher in law um, uh, at various universities in, um, in Belgium. And so having embarrassed him fully, I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Just. Just, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um... So much compliments, so many compliments. Thank you. I hope you hear me. Um, let me pull up my slides. Um, right, hope technology works, right? Yes, do you see it, Ian? It's all okay? So yes, yes, yes. fine. Okay, thank good. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, a big thank you, a warm thank you to my friends of the UNEC and ITU. Uh, we've been together in many years and I really congratulate the organizers uh, and the respective hierarchy for having organized this new edition. It's even more timely than ever. Uh, connected automated mobility is not a buzzword anymore. It was maybe one than years ago, but today you see it actually live on the street with a lot of coordination efforts. And I've been asked to, um, to give and to shed our lights on how do we see governmental coordination for actually automated driving up to autonomous driving and, and intelligent transport systems. I also have to congratulate uh, the UNEC friends for the webinars that I have organized on ITS, which we also have been participated to, and also uh, various other efforts on ITS together with the telecommunications uh, community. Y yes, could I just interrupt? Could you put your screen on presentation? Mark? Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you. If that works. Yeah, I cannot put it, I cannot put it bigger, to be honest, I'm sorry. That's the max I can get, uh, Ian, here, yeah. sorry. Um, allow me to go quickly through a number of big tickets first um, as incoming CEO of Ertico ITS Europe. Um, this is actually a unique public-private partnership that I'm leading with uh, the whole team. 
and it's the, the the core business is bringing the world of connectivity and automated mobility together in one uh, which is uh, touching on all the subjects that you see on this slide um, this slide is not only about ITS, it's much more about an ecosystem that we didn't see 20 years ago, or at least very rudimentally. Today, it's, it's actually happening. It's live. And so with our partnership with more than 120, I would say, companies, institutions, universities, but also governmental authorities, up to local um, authorities, we gather these partners to make it happen, to make ITS and, um, I would say, the combination with a connected automated mobility, smart mobility and sustainable mobility happening on the roads. This is being done by an intensive cooperation amongst the eight sectors. You see them here on the screen. Uh, it goes from traffic providers, transport providers, public authorities, road authorities, OEMs, suppliers and the like. So a whole scala of people and institutions working in my backyard here with Ertigo in Brussels and beyond. Uh, we definitely have coordination as this title of the conference here is about coordination of governmental authorities with, with industry. That's definitely something we do. I have regular updates with my colleagues in Asia Pacific and the US, um, also with the national ITS organizations. Um, they have the ITS nationals group that we are powering with them. And we have our congresses, of course, that are much more than just an exhibition. It's actually a congress with scientific papers with the changes of ideas like we are doing now. Actually, the first Congress is being taking place uh, very soon in Asia. Uh, John, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your slides are not moving, so ah. you can go with the slideshow. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't slides. know why. I don't know yeah. what's happening. Um, let me put it like this then, Stefano. Um, it's not, yeah, okay. It's not, um, how do you call it, um, the presentation mode. It is okay. acceptable. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry for that. Um, so with our cooperation, governmental and the industry, we have intensive contacts with our colleagues in the Asia Pacific and ITS America, obviously. Um, and they organize conf conferences, congresses like you do. Uh, the first coming is the one in Asia, in Chengdu in China, actually, very soon now, organized by my colleagues of the Asia Pacific. The other one is the one I'm organizing with our team here in Europe, in Toulouse. So I warmly welcome you to our French uh, Congress, our uh, European Congress in France, where we will showcase connected and automated mobility and sustainable mobility. Now, our focus areas nicely fit with what you're uh, discussing in this setting. It's smart mobility, which goes beyond CCAM or connected cooperative and automated mobility. It's also about clean eco-mobility. So about climate, uh, the climate goals of the UN and especially the European Commission here in Europe. Uh, eco-mobility about air pollution and city um, clean air. But next to that, about integration, integration of transport modes, integration of payment modes, and integration of, I would say, I would say uh, transport um, systems. Yeah. Easier said than done. We all have our issues on that. And in Europe, we are showcasing quite a lot of good things on urban mobility and mobility as a service. We have a dedicated alliance called the European um, mass alliance that uh, we are leading here in Brussels, and it's bringing together 100, more than 100 companies and uh, institutions to provide interoperable mass services. Last but not least, transport and logistics has a lot to do with dematerialization of documents. Very um, satisfactory, the UN has uh, the ECMR documents, so a single flow uh, electronic documents, thanks to the friends of UNEC and many others. Um, and my good colleagues of the IRU. Uh, but also this means that we can have seamless documents electronically through connectivity, but also seamless, I uh, would say transport between hubs, uh, between uh, ports uh, connected with um, containers and so on and so on. So all this is happening with roadmaps that we have. I invite you to go to our website or contact us. We have very detailed roadmaps on all this with all the projects that we have plotted in there and the regulatory policy framework that you see on the right side of this slide, actually saying what is Europe um, doing in its backyard and what's, what are the policies on connected and automated uh, and these things. Which brings me to the topic of today, automated driving. Um, what we see is that a vehicle is not a vehicle standalone anymore, especially automated driving vehicles. They are interacting with the physical environment, with the digital environment, with the driver, with the HD maps, etc. 
This means we need definitely a good representation of the physical attributes of the streets, of the layout. That is being done by digital twins. We have numerous projects going on there with local authorities, but that's not the only one. We need seamless connectivity cross-border. 4G is nice, 5G is even better, and 6G is probably even better. But what about cross-border? Um, I would say handover of the cells and handover of the connectivity, ubiquity, and latency. Um, we have a number of projects coming on. 5G Mobix is one of them that we are leading with Ertico and the Commission. And it's actually showcasing that uh, cross-border, there will be a continued guaranteed, uh, very low latency and handover of the signals from one country to another one. Um, we see that also this area in truck platooning. Last week, I was happy to close the, the event on a truck platooning challenge, which we've done for five years, four to five years. It's called Ensemble, the project together with TNO and many other partners where we have showcased um, cross-border truck platooning. So it's combining connectivity and automated driving in one thing um, with V2V communication and V2I, uh, mostly V2V in this case. Uh, we showcase that truck platooning can become a reality and, and it's, it's working hand in hand with the road authorities and the local community. Now, when asking who should do what, how to coordinate all these elements, um, I've put some examples of the levels of intervention. Some intervention is very good and very well made at UNEC level and ITU level. I'll give you some examples. Um, the R155 and 156, excellent instruments for a harmonized world in terms of cybersecurity and software updates. Yeah. That's one, but it's not enough. We know that regional focus from European Commission, for example, is there also in some other regions. Uh, ALKS is there for high levels of automated driving, but not yet beyond the 60 kilometers or 70, but, but it will come. And, and that is something we're really looking forward to make it happen worldwide for our vehicle manufacturers and suppliers. The interpretation of Article 8 on the Vienna and Geneva Conventions. What does it mean uh, to be in control of the traffic situation? What does it mean to be a driver? What is a driver? Is it a human being? Is it a remote, uh, I would say, device, etc.? We've seen the interpretation of WP1 in the UNEC, quite happy with that. Um, we need to have more traction now also at, at the regional level, in this case, at my European level, to have a one-stop shopping with traffic rules because we don't have that in Europe. We have every country has its own traffic legislation. Some of it is even adapted to automated and even autonomous driving. But what I don't see yet is a European approach on traffic regulations across the board, for cross-border, for example. Um, ITS is definitely a big ticket. Uh, we just are now in the review mode of an ITS directive, which is talking about multimodality, about safety, and about, um, I would say, mobility as a services. Uh, so these things become reality also in terms of legislation. There's a lot of regulations also on safety and type approval with the European breakdown on the local level. Uh, but on even more local level, we see in the urban area, a lot of national, well, I would say very local regulations, urban vehicle access regulations, for example, time uh, restrictions, um, restrictions of what kind of vehicles can hit the roads in the cities. Um, taxation is different. Um, we would like to see a bit more, I would say, leveling of the playing field and a bit more panorama at the regional level. And we are pleased that the European Commission came out with drafts, we take guidance for that in December, but it's not enough. We need to go further and we have some projects going on. I haven't even talked about uh, data, the data mobility spaces that we are driving now in Europe, um, the whole spectrum allocation, which is not harmonized neither. Uh, it's still a national resource for most of the issues. Um, the ITS uh, area in terms of the use of the spectrum. Um, we also see difference worldwide between EU, United States and Japan, for example. Uh, it will also be nice to have a bit more cohesion, I would say, amongst these um, frequency allocation. Um, this brings me to this slide that it's it's time to prepare coordination with all these actors. Uh, and I don't say it because this is the title of our section here, but it's about coordinating the road infrastructure with those who use the road infrastructure. My members, my OEMs, but also other transport mode, the public transport mode, for example. Take into account lead times, please, when regulating things. Automotive lead times can go from three to five years, even longer. The same for some other industry. The road authorities have probably even longer the lead times in terms of investment. So all this need to be 
taken into account and synchronized. And talking about synchronization, uh, we see the same with testing and validation of automated driving. We have a very local and national approach now with uh, Germany has a new law or has updated the law on automated driving up to level four and even higher. France, UK, the same. Uh, I would like to see a European framework, which is now becoming reality, hopefully by end of this year, if I listen to European Commission, did you grow with a new, I would say a new horizontal regulation on European type approval for, for automated driving, including testing and validation. Um, communication technologies, now that we have the friends of our ITU uh, here, um, everybody talks about technologically neutrality. I understand that everybody's doing that and I understand very well how, but how will you have a marriage between instruments that are not talking the same technology? Will you impose a given technology to everybody, including the legacy fleet, including the legacy technologies? How will you cope with compatibility, upwards or backwards compatibility? These are important subjects. We discussed it already uh, in the spectrum area. We will now test and validate this also on the practice with real uh, vehicles and real time, I would say other instruments. And finally, the trust of the user. It's not only about us supplying the best, nicest vehicle or connected train or connected tram bus or micro mobility. It's about how do we gain the trust of the user when things getting connected and automated? What about those who do not want to be connected and automated or cannot afford to be? Yeah. What about data protection? What about cloud systems that are running in the air? And we all have our act together, but we need to explain this to the user, to the citizens. And that is another focus element of Vertigo. We're going to check how to bring this message to actually the user, how to be sure that he has a safe environment where he can use a robot taxi, where he can use a connected, I would say, cloud system with smart cities and using the devices and that he's running with. Um, a lot of work to do, and I believe that we could that together also could do that with UNEC and ITU, because the world gets very complex to explain all this. That's exactly what we want to do. Uh, this is definitely a, not a good slide, but it's, it mentions our roadmaps on CCAM, Connected, Cooperated, and Automated Mobility. These are all the projects and all the, I would say, the forward-looking um, hurdles that we want to, to take, but also to make it happen. Um, which brings me to these next generation solutions. There's one common denominator on all this, it's data, it's information and it's intelligence. Yeah. We needed to marriage all these new uh, spaces, I would say cyberspaces, but it's also very tangible um, and happy to have many projects here uh, that we have in, in, uh, in Ertico, which brings me to the last slide. You're also very warmly welcomed in our European Congress end of the month of May, uh, where we're going to showcase for 4,000 people everything we do on smart mobility, automated driving, connected, public-private on this. So thank you for your um, for your questions, if you have them, and back to you, Ian. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much. Yes, um, <clears throat> as I said, I'd, I'd like to deal with the questions, I think, in the panel session. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a couple of questions coming already. Um, so maybe you could have a look at those um, in, as we listen to the other uh, presenters. So let me now move on to our second presenter, um, who is Birgit Ulrich Rudolph from, uh, from Germany. Um, uh, Birgit is a really important person thinking about some of the questions, some of the issues that were raised by just a moment ago, because Birgit is chairing a UNEC group of experts on drafting a new legal instrument um, to deal with automated vehicles in traffic. Um, uh, now, I'm sure she'll tell us more about that. But in her, in, in her day job, when she's not doing things in the UNECE, um, she's the deputy head of the Division Digital, Digitalization of Mobility, Autonomous Driving and Intelligent Transport Systems at the German Ministry for Digital Affairs and Transport, and I think based in Berlin. Um, she does various uh, activities around Europe. Um, uh, she has been on the European International Fora, including EU data for road safety. Um, uh, she's also the German delegate to the WP1, the road safety group within the UNECE, and has done a huge amount of work on 
um, environmental issues, especially around the Arctic, uh, where she was the German representative on the Arctic Council's expert group on black carbon and methane. Um, she's also a guest lecturer at the universities of Potsdam and Dresden in Germany and holds a PhD in international law. Um, so, Birgit, you're very welcome to the Future Network Car event. And maybe you could tell us about your work in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you to ITU and UNECE for having me uh, with you today. Um, speaking after someone like yours is not an easy <laughs> task because he has been around uh, for long and uh, many of you uh, uh, might not uh, know my face, but I will do my best to uh, share some insights on uh, the German landscape, as well as uh, our uh, German input contributions exchanges on the European and international level. Next slide, please. So exactly, um, talking about the German landscape uh, with a spotlight on uh, the German Act on Autonomous uh, Driving. And then uh, next steps, next steps nationally on the European level as well as on the international level. So let me start with the national uh, level, the German landscape. We do have an act on uh, intelligent transport systems, intelligent transport systems act uh, first passed in 2013 and amended in 2017, implementing the EU Directive 2010-40. In uh, 2017, we passed uh, the eighth act amending our National Road Traffic Act, including provisions uh, in, in relation to level uh, three vehicles in our German Road Traffic Act, that was in 2017. And rather recently, last year in 2021, we uh, passed an act again, amending our National Road Traffic Act, as well as our National Compulsory Insurance Act, um, the act we call Act on Autonomous Driving, where we focus on level four uh, vehicles. And uh, my colleagues are busy right now <laughs> working on uh, the accompanying ordinance um, in order to implement uh, this act. Uh, this ordinance is in the process of uh, being finalized. Thank you. So what are our overarching objectives of this uh, German act on autonomous driving? Um, in the top left corner, you see in red, um, our main goal is to increase road safety. This is really our key concern. And we hope with uh, some of the acts I just uh, mentioned that we can uh, help increase uh, road safety, not only in Germany, but also on the European and international level. We aim at reducing emissions, we would like uh, to boost innovations, uh, we would like to make testing easier, uh, increase transport efficiency, enable new mobility concepts, and also, of course, uh, hope for a better participation of mobility impaired uh, persons and, and make uh, uh, the, the whole uh, transport system uh, more holistic. Next slide, please. Some, uh, some key facts about our act on autonomous driving. Uh, we focus on uh, shuttles, autonomous shuttles. So to say driverless vehicles uh, that can move either people or goods, which we call people are goods movers. <laughs> and uh, also we, we focus on uh, uh, nationwide testing of autonomous and automated vehicles. 
we um, established a set of rules for level four vehicles going beyond experimentation and prototypes. And we enabled the commercialization of automated uh, transport of people and goods. That's the so-called people and goods movers. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, liability, we, um, in, uh, in this act on autonomous driving, we still have, uh, we stick to our national principle of the owner's uh, liability and say, this also applies to automated and autonomous driving when it comes to our national legal framework. However, we, in addition, have introduced a person which we call a technical supervisor. Uh, we have done this to incorporate the requirements of the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. Um, in principle, this person is still uh, the owner of the vehicle if he or she does not delegate uh, this task. And the technical supervisor, uh, like uh, the owner is obliged to take out and maintain a compulsory third party insurance. We, in this uh, act on autonomous driving, have included additional obligations, especially in relation to manufacturers and owners. Some uh, possible use cases. We aim at creating a broad framework for different use cases. Um, the already mentioned people and, and good movers, uh, hub to hub traffic, fleet services, city buses, uh, focusing on the first or the last mile, on demand services, demand oriented offers in peak times, connection of production sites, uh, on site traffic when it comes to hospitals, amusement parks. And uh, for N1 vehicles, uh, we focus on the distribution of goods in the city center, in addition, or rather replacing larger vehicles. Next slide, please. So on the national level, what are our next steps now that we have some of uh, the legislation I just mentioned. We will uh, rather sooner than later evaluate our act on autonomous driving and with our new government and uh, a new coalition treaty, we are already busy uh, starting to implement uh, the coalition treaty, which means we have started an investigation for uh, new or amended rules on liability and the use of data to name two examples where we feel uh, we might need to take another look. We have been tasked to develop a long-term public transport strategy for autonomous and connected driving, including digital mobility services, innovative mobility solutions and car sharing, as well as the development of an intermodal approach to automated and connected driving. On the European and the international level, we will continue our harmonization efforts when it comes to technical and legal rules and regulations. If needed, of course, um, the adaptation of European directives and regulations. On the European level, um, when it comes to automated driving, we are fairly active in the motor vehicles working group, especially the subgroup on automated and connected vehicles. And on the international level, Ian already mentioned it and Joost already spoke about WP1, the World Forum for Road Traffic Safety. We're active there. We will remain active and engaged. And also on the international level, uh, the aim, the goal is to uh, work towards harmonization of rules and regulations. Next slide, please. So on the international level, some of our uh, key activities, key achieve, past achievements. 
in September uh, 2020, this was uh, part of uh, the WP1 activities. Um, the group adopted an amendment to the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic defining automated driving system and dynamic control, as well as introducing a new Article 34 bis to the Vienna Convention, with a, uh, which deems the driver requirement rather central uh, addition to this convention for many contracting parties. And very recently, this, uh, this month, actually, we finalized the draft resolution on other activities while driving. And we hope to adopt uh, this resolution at the fall session of WP1. Our cur current focus, um, however, really lies with a rather new group established under the UNECE umbrella, the so-called uh, group of experts on LIEV, um, tasked to draft a new legal instrument on the use of automated vehicles in traffic, also called WP1 slash GE3, because WP1 is the parent body of this group, where we aim to go beyond amendments, amendments to conventions, or legally non-binding recommendations, but rather uh, prepare uh, the draft of a new legal instrument on the use of automated vehicles on in domestic and international traffic. So what does the roadmap of this new group look like? Uh, certain, uh, certain key milestones uh, we have identified during the past two formal sessions of the group. At present, we are busy assessing road safety risks posed by the use of automated vehicles. We will identify an instrument type. We will check the legal toolbox available on the international level to determine, are we talking about a new convention? Are we talking about a protocol? Um, what, uh, what suits best um, for automated vehicles? We will be addressing the scope of this new legal instrument. And of course, speaking about legal implications. We then are tasked to draft an initial set of provisions, legal provisions, and finally to submit a draft of this new legal instrument uh, included in a report to the parent body to WP1. Next slide, please. Okay, <laughs> the last of one. Um, thank you very much uh, for now. Uh, I think Ian mentioned it. Uh, please put for the time being put your questions in uh, in the chat, and we will move to the next uh, presenter and have a Q and A session later on. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Brigitte, for that helpful explanation of all the work going on in Germany and also the work in um, in your group GE three that I. Personally, I think is going to be really, really important and significant in how we shape the future internationally on the use of automated or highly automated vehicles as, as we go forward in the coming decades. So personally, I wish you all the luck and the successful outcome with that. Um, but now, as Birgit has just said, we move on to our next, uh, our next guest speaker, who is Maria Christina Galassi. Um, uh, Maria Christina is a scientific project officer at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre <clears throat> in ISPRA. Um, uh, she studied aerospace engineering at the University of Pisa and received her PhD in nuclear and industrial safety. Um, she currently leads the JRC activities on the safety of connected and automated vehicles, which you'll appreciate will be supporting the development of the new EU and global regulatory framework for automated driving systems. As part of that work, she's responsible for the 
RICAM project covering the broader scope of the implications of connecting automated mobility and a similar project, the Matika project, exploring the possibility of monitoring road infrastructure through sensors and onboard uh, sensors of onboard autonomous vehicles. So, uh, Maria, Christina, uh, hopefully you can now give us your presentation and I look forward to it greatly. Thank you very much, Maria Christina. Thank you, Jan, for your kind introduction. And uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to join this session today. I'm very happy to be here. And today I will share with you uh, collaboration and coordination activities where as GRC we are involved and where we are also bringing our contribution at both the EU and also global level. So next slide, please. So first of all, I would like to mention that both coordination and collaboration actions play a fundamental role to progress in the development and deployment of driving automation. So on one side, government authorities, uh, the need to uh, uh, foster coordination to develop harmonized and interoperable solutions and to ensure that a multi-step approval process works finally uh, also at national and local level. On the other side, collaboration among stakeholders is key to overcome the difficulties of dealing with such complex systems as autonomous vehicles are. And let me add that this should not happen only at um, uh, at the level of the automotive sector, so involving automotive stakeholders, but also we should go beyond that because, as I will mention later in my presentation, there's a lot that we can learn also from other uh, sectors. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned before, coordination is happening and it should happen at different levels. So at global level, we are working on the urbanization of technical rules within the UNEC framework. And as was mentioned also by previous speakers, indeed there are several active informal working groups uh, working on uh, functional requirements, working on validation methods. Uh, so trying to develop uh, general guidelines, but also uh, an important milestone was achieved uh, with the issue of the ELCAS regulation. Uh, which is uh, now undergoing uh, an amendment to extend it also uh, to higher speed and to include also lane change. At EU level, we are defining the new type approval framework for automated vehicles, and I will give you more details on that in the next slide. Uh, but of course, this doesn't stop here because, uh, uh, for example, for some of the level four applications, um, the approval process uh, cannot stop at uh, European level, but needs to be uh, undergoing also at national and local level. So there should be a coordination also to develop a standardized approach uh, also within member states and uh, urban authorities. Next slide, please. So since 2019, we have this new uh, legal framework uh, given by the new um, EU General Safety Regulation. Uh, this covers different levels of uh, automation, but also provides the legal basis for developing technical rules for connected and automated vehicles. So uh, we are indeed in the process of developing these uh, technical rules and we follow two work streams. So we are involved in the EU discussion on level four, but also we are involved, heavily involved on UNEC discussion on level two and three. So uh, the European Commission is indeed drafting and the process is almost finalized. Uh, the new uh, ADS uh, implementing regulation, implementing act, sorry, uh, that covers level four applications. And this indeed harmonizes what was already done in the past at member state level. So we had a previous speaker introducing the work done by Germany, but we are also we also took into account what done by France. And this uh, regulation covers the approval of autonomous shuttles, robot taxi, hub to hub applications, and automated valid parking. 
And this will be done under the small series scheme. So uh, up to 1,500 uh, registered vehicle a year. Uh, sorry, vehicle model, <laughs> not total vehicle, vehicle model a year. Um, and this limitation is in part due to uh, the need to, uh, uh, let, let me say, uh, test <laughs> this first uh, uh, regulation, but also the need to uh, uh, give F time to update all the applicable regulations so that they can be uh, used also for automated and connected vehicles. Uh, on the other side, as I mentioned, we are working within the UNEC framework. Uh, so European Commission is leading the task force on uh, uh, ADAS to develop a new regulation. And we also took part in the process of uh, amending uh, UN Regulation 157. Beside that, uh, I also want to highlight the important work being carried out by the informal working groups FRAV and VMAT, uh, where indeed uh, guidelines on the uh, requirements and also validation method for automated vehicles of all level and for all use cases are being developed. And so we hope that following up on this work, also use cases considered and covered by uh, the EU, uh, new ADS re regulation will be considered and discussed also at the UNEC level. Next slide, please. So another important uh, coordination level, of course, is uh, the coordination between regulators and industry. So uh, in order to uh, develop suitable regulations, regulators should take into account also the uh, technology readiness. And so for this, we interacted a lot with the industry stakeholders. And here you can see a roadmap of uh, market ready or upcoming technologies to the market in the next years. And this we considered in, indeed for setting up uh, the new uh, EU ADS implementing act. And here you can see also the use cases covered by the new regulation. Of course, our goal in the end is reaching uh, the target of vision zero. Uh, so uh, reaching uh, close to zero fatalities on road uh, by 2015. Next slide, please. And here I summarized a bit uh, the new uh, EU approach for regulating automated driving that is reflected in the EU uh, ADS regulation. Uh, so we introduced here new concepts, taking into account analytical methodologies for safety demonstration, together with the more conventional physical testing. Uh, and we also added indeed the approach of uh, improvement through the operational experience feedback. And uh, some of you uh, are working, I guess, with the work done at UNEC level. And you may notice this is perfectly uh, aligned with the multipillar approach discussed uh, also at UNEC level. So the role of GRC here was to provide technical input uh, to uh, the colleagues in the GCRO, and indeed they are uh, the ones responsible for drafting the regulation. As you can see here, we have basically three uh, pillars, uh, so three distinct phases on the approval phase, on the, the approval process. The first pillar includes audit of the safety management system, so will be done indeed uh, as a, a, a procedural uh, uh, examination of the processes linked to safety. Uh, and then also the uh, automated driving system safety assessment and this also will be done through documentation uh, submitted by the manufacturer to the authority and including indeed all information related to the design development and validation process then we will have a phase of confirmation through testing so here for testing we consider uh, track testing uh, so in a closed confined environment and real world testing that will be a, a let's say a confirmation of the results achieved before uh, so that we, we can be perfectly sure already of the level of safety reached by the ADS before testing it on public roads and then finally we will have a third pillar after marketing production um, that indeed will allow for improvement 
thanks to the operational experience feedback. And this is the in-service monitoring the reporting pillar. Uh, so uh, thanks to that pillar, indeed, we will be able to confirm the level of safety of the automated vehicles once introduced in the real world. And we will also be able to um, indeed discover uh, and collect information about new scenarios, so new situations that were not considered uh, beforehand in the previous phases, because the world as we know it will change once driving automation will be actually on our roads. And it could be also that some uh, situations that could be uh, really easy uh, for human drivers in, indeed require more attention for um, automated driving systems. And the last objective of this third pillar is indeed the experience uh, sharing. So we want to learn from what is happening uh, in the real world, especially for what concerns accidents. We want to learn and we want to derive safety recommendations to be shared among stakeholders. Uh, this is a good practice also already applied in uh, uh, other sectors and we believe that that could be indeed the best way to uh, coordinate and collaborate also in the automotive sector and finally you can see the scenario catalog as uh, um, as a common framework between manufacturers and authorities uh, this indeed we believe that is fundamental uh, because it will help on one side the manufacturers to understand which are the minimum requirements uh, for their safety validation, so the minimum uh, set of situations to be considered uh, for the validation process. On the other side, it will be useful for the authorities because it will, will give indeed a basis on which to verify um, how the ATS have been tested and verified by the manufacturer. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned before that coordination between member states is also important uh, because not the work will be done at European level. Still, we understand that new competences uh, are needed and will be, uh, will be developed by member state authorities. And to have this process, uh, as GRC, we are also thinking about setting up a working group um, composed by representatives from member states, authorities, but also from industry, and their contribution from industry will be very important, to develop technical guidelines. Uh, these technical guidelines will address the several aspects covered by the regulation, uh, the EU ADS regulation, as for example, uh, the documentation to be provided for the safety assessment, on one side, so on the manufacturer's side, but on the authority side, how this documentation should be assessed and evaluated. Uh, guidelines also on the testing procedure, so how the technical services are going to test uh, on track and on road uh, the ADS vehicles, and also technical guidelines on other aspects. And uh, as taking example from other fields, maybe also some trainings um, or uh, workshop be organized to share the authorities and indeed we foundation member states before this safety recommendation as of the in-service monitoring and reporting pillar and we believe that this is essential because this is uh, the real mechanism that can allow safety improvement, also for automated vehicles as done in many other sectors. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, uh, we, are, we might not be fully ready uh, to set up this approval framework, uh, also to deploy it in practice. Uh, and we identified some existing gaps on which we are working together also with the member states and the industry in the motor vehicle working group, um, the, the ACV, the Automated Connected Vehicle subgroup mentioned also by uh, the previous speakers. Uh, so here I listed some of the existing gaps that will be filled uh, also plus possibly with the guidelines that I mentioned. And as you can see, uh, of course, in-service monitoring and reporting is one of the aspects that uh, is more innovative, let's say, for the automotive sector. And so it's the one that most probably will need uh, more, more work, more uh, 
dedicated time on that. But of course, the interaction and the connectivity and infrastructure are fundamental aspects that need to be uh, further uh, discussed and uh, possibly developed uh, as far as, uh, as well as traffic rules. Uh, so these are under responsibility of member states. Uh, but of course, we understand that having a normalization also on this aspect will help the deployment of automated driving. Next slide, please. And as I referred previously uh, during my presentation, there is a lot that we can learn from other sectors. So here you can see some uh, just examples that I mentioned, uh, referring to aviation, referring to railway, and also referring to a nuclear sector. So I do not expect <laughs> uh, you to believe that, of course, uh, approving uh, the safety of an automated vehicle uh, involve the same effort or the same aspects as for airplanes, trains, or uh, nuclear power plants. But there are methodologies that have been developed through decades and are robust enough to be also applied to the automotive sector. So, for example, we can learn from aviation and uh, railway sector uh, how to uh, deploy the, and develop this framework for in-service monitoring and reporting. So they have done this uh, in the last decades. Uh, and here you can see the reference to the uh, ICARES uh, portal, uh, where there is a collection of information on uh, anomalies, so abnormal events related to um, uh, a plane operation. But there is also a portal where the safety recommendations are publicly shared among stakeholders so that indeed the lessons learned can be useful, not just for the uh, operator or the manufacturer involved, but also to the other stakeholders. And we can find very useful guidelines, for example, on the uh, safety management system uh, for what concern uh, guidelines given by the European Railway Safety Agency. And then there are also other methodologies uh, that are, have been uh, developed for nuclear power plants, but can, be, can prove to be useful also for um, the risk assessment uh, of automated vehicles. And these are just examples. So what I wanted to stress with this slide again is that collaboration is essential among stakeholders. But this should not be limited to the automotive sector because indeed there is a lot that we can learn also looking outside uh, to the, the other sectors. Next slide, please. So this brings me to my last slide and I would like to conclude with this quote from the ECARES website. So we should follow the guiding principle that safety is of a global concern and its improvement should not be limited by geographical or organizational borders. So once again, coordination and collaboration activities are the way forward. Thank you for your attention. Next slide. Give you back the floor, Jan. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank, thank you very much, Maria Cristina. Um, that was a great presentation and uh, you won't be surprised by me saying a, Brit a British man was interested in what you're doing in the EU. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, there's a few questions there. I, I was particularly taken by your thinking around training um, because especially in a type of approval regime where inherently or implicitly it relies on the competence of the people assessing the vehicles. I think that's a very constructive um, uh, point. Um, and also the connectivity, um, which we might come back to in the questions and answers in the panel session if we have time. But anyway, um, we now move on to our next speaker, speaker rather, sorry, uh, Dino uh, Nadicio from um, Cavnu. Uh, we've heard from a couple of uh, speakers from Europe. Now we're jumping to North America to bring in the truly international flavour of our meeting. Um, so uh, Dino is Head of Automotive and AV Partnerships at Cavnu. He has an extensive background in the automotive industry, starting at General Motors and then moving on to Magna International, where he served as the Global Vice President on R&D and more recently on Advanced Technology Engineering, 
where he's led their business development, engineering and product portfolio activities. Um, he has uh, a master's in engineering from Purdue University and also a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from Michigan University. So Dino, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ian, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. As Ian mentioned, I am the head of automotive and AV partnerships at Cavenu. Uh, very excited to be here today to talk about the future of roads. So roadway design is based on vehicle physics. And when you think of the design elements that accommodate vehicles traveling on roads, uh, that has traditionally focused on things like the width of the lane, the width of the shoulder, uh, the signage that's on the road, the curvature of the road, uh, the manner in which vehicles can egress and enter uh, the lane, uh, in a highway environment, as an example. But there is another aspect to consider uh, about the roadway design. And that is, um, it's based on humans driving the vehicles. And they're dealing with other issues. Issues like unpredictable road actors. And we mean individuals or actors like that lane splitting motorcycle, pedestrians, uh, and other vulnerable road users. Uh, there's unpredictable infrastructure like defaced signs and poor lane markings. And let's face it, the environment is unpredictable, whether it's due to weather, lighting, or foreign object debris that's on the road. Now, when you look at the numbers, the, the, the results are not good, at least not in the US. In the last decade, um, there's been more than 370,000 incidents. And unfortunately, we've had more than 35,000 of them uh, result in deaths on our roads. So the you know, roadway fatalities and the fatality rate have declined consistently for a number of years. The progress has kind of stalled over the last decade. And actually, it went in the wrong direction in 2020. When we compared to 2019, as an example, fatalities actually increased uh, overall by over 7%. So I know we've all seen the different levels of autonomy. And we are actually seeing a tipping point with the advent of today's modern advanced driver assist systems. And specifically, we see the transition from vehicles that have at least two automated functions like adaptive cruise control and lane centering. But you know, the driver still must be ready to take control of the vehicle at any time. Um, to the point where the vehicles are able to perform specific legs of a trip where the human drivers are still necessary. However, they're not required to monitor the situation. You know, five years ago, there was a lot of L4 hype. Um, today, I think that hype has been somewhat tempered, but we are starting to see a clear pathway for the different form factors, like trucking, uh, public transportation, and passenger vehicles, where automated and autonomous driving systems will be able to improve the safety, uh, provide a better driver experience, reduce operating expenses, uh, increase throughput, and, and improve overall reliability. So domestically in the US, we are starting to see uh, an increase in penetration of L2 driving systems. And most recently, the growth of hands-off driving systems like GM Super Cruise, which is available on over 22 of its models and Ford's Blue Cruise, which is available on 11 of its models. And we're definitely starting to see an uptick with other OEMs that are coming to market 
with their own hands-off systems over the next two years. So now let's ask, what can we accomplish if the roadways were also designed for the vehicle technology? We discussed how more and more of today's vehicles are coming to market with advanced and smarter driving systems. However, road infrastructure has not kept pace with that of automotive technology, which is woefully inadequate to help these vehicles reach their full potential. Fundamentally, smart cars need smarter roads that are safer and more efficient. So at Cavnew, we believe that by simplifying the driving environment and providing digital insights to vehicles about what is happening around them and on the road ahead, will accelerate the benefits of connected and automated driving. So what do I mean? When I say simplify, I mean providing consistency and reliability that the road will not only be the same today, but tomorrow and the next day on specific roadway elements like the road surface, the lane markings, the lighting, traffic control devices, objects on the road, et cetera. Enhancing the roadway elements uh, that are critical for the vehicle's perception systems and mean, minimizing vehicle cut-ins and cutouts with the use of physical separation like bollards or delineators. So we plan on deploying roadway sensors approximately every 200 meters to provide a full view of the roadway beyond the field of view of the vehicles that are on those roads. And we will develop insights that detect what is happening on the road and provide that information directly to vehicles. Information to vehicles about other vehicles, vulnerable road users, foreign objects on the road, the condition of the road, et cetera. And finally, the CAV lane informs L2 plus vehicles with information from the infrastructure to enhance its perception and its path planning. So a little bit more detail on the concept of operations for a CAV news system architecture. So the physical operating design domain is simplified and enhanced, as I mentioned favorable lane attributes and geometry, the curvature, lighting, high contrast lane markings. Vehicle and road state information is collected using the sensor pods that are along the roadway. And our digital twin takes the sense data, aggregates it and interprets the information. And the ideal state is calculated and transmitted to vehicles from the infrastructure. And for road owners and operators, we provide insights to facilitate decision-making and enable control and optimization of not only the road, but also of fleet operations and maintenance. And currently we are working on a first of its kind, 40 mile CAV lane corridor between Detroit and Ann Arbor. That's going to improve the safety, connectivity, accessibility and affordability of mobility in Southeast Michigan. It will include the highway, the arterial roads, and also dense urban operating design domains. We are finalizing the planning and feasibility exercise, but we've already deployed a number of sensor pods along one of the highways in parallel with simulation activity and controlled test track testing. So as we amplify the road or excuse me, as we simplify the road complexity problem uh, and amplify what's possible, we look for everyone to join us on the road to the future of mobility. And thank you for your time today. Ian? Thanks very much, Dino. I'm just waiting for the video. Oh, here we are. Great. Um, I mean, the, the, it's incredible the kind of investment you must be putting into this to get this working. Um, I'd be interested if we get time in the Q&A to understand um, 
the issues around the connectivity. I think you said 200 meters was the distance um, between your pods. Um, but let's not go into that now because I don't want to steal the participants' opportunities for questions. But that's kind of what you, you know, prompted in my own thinking, listening to what you were saying. So uh, great. Thanks very much. So um, that was that was our contribution for North America. We're now going to swing back to 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 Europe um, and uh, we're going to be uh, listening to Llewellyn Morgan. Um, now Llewellyn comes from Oxfordshire County Council in uh, in central England. Um, some of you may know that Oxford is one of the oldest university cities in the world. Um, I think the university is about 900 to 1000 years old so it, it is a very historic city. And, and I know that creates all sorts of challenges when you're thinking about putting really innovative technology solutions into historic cities. Um, so um, Llewellyn uh, has been working in this area for many, many years. He's led various projects um, uh, looking at new mobility models and developing collaborative approaches to find solutions to the challenges of uh, modern transport systems in historic settings. Um, now, I could tell you a lot more about Llewellyn, but time, time's against us, Llewellyn, so I hope you won't mind if I just invite you to make yeah. your presentation. Llewellyn, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk about some of the work um, we do. So um, I'm going to talk about the connected vehicles, but also some of the connected uh, infrastructure and connected mobility in general as well. Um, so go beyond just the cars themselves, hopefully. Um, Ian gave a bit of a background. I think um, I know plenty of people know about Oxford, but um, just as a sort of background to, to the transport side of it, um, Oxford's a very small city uh, geographically. Um, it's it's con contained on all sides pretty much by rivers. Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to put new infrastructure into it. It's also an ancient city. Um, so the idea of um, knocking down one of our medieval buildings or uh, one of the university's buildings to make way for transport infrastructure is uh, not very appealing to most people. So um, we have sort of massive transport challenges. Uh, historic culture has been quite um, forward thinking, um, certainly for a British council anyway, uh, maybe not in comparison to some of our European partners, but on a British council we have. Um, in terms of looking at managing transport and cars into the city. So it took an approach uh, back in the 70s of starting to reduce that. It actually came up with the first park and ride system in the world to start to manage um, cars and getting people onto public transport rather than driving into the centre of Oxford. So it's got that as a background and that's always been, that's been across the political spectrums. Um, but the challenge is still there. Um, We've still got thousands of cars coming to Oxford every day. Um, a recent study showed that 40% of the trips that were going to Oxford were actually through trips, which to any sane person seems mad because no one would ever, in their right mind would ever try and drive through Oxford. But 40% of people do, um, and it's causing a big issue. Um, we've sort of managed to stabilise the amount of trips, but they haven't the, the number of figures of car trips have, hasn't continued to decrease. So um, that's our next challenge. Um, we have the second highest number of um, cycle users for uh, journey to work in the UK. Only Cambridge has higher um, figures, um, but there's plenty to do with that. That's, I would say, in all honesty, that's not because of the council. That's that's despite the council that we've got such cycling levels. We've not done a great job of building infrastructure. We're starting to, and we certainly recognise that, and that's our priority now. But it's um, it's not been great up to now. A few years ago, about seven years ago now, uh, under our local transport policy, we realised that we had to integrate innovation much more thoroughly into policy and strategy work. And we developed a sub strategy from a policy that's called local transport plans in the UK called science transit strategy. Um, the key for us and the key for me 
And my team was, we adopted a policy as a council around innovation, transport and use in Oxfordshire is effectively as a living lab um, to test out new technology that could help us solve some of our major challenges like congestion, um, transport, decarbonisation and general and um, work around place shaping in general. Um, since that time, we're sort of moving through this world of going from that predict and provide approach to decide and provide and our aim, I think, from our side is to build a level of data and understanding of a place that we can almost get to an iterate and adapt approach where we understand what's happening um, in our place um, constantly so we can start to look at providing a new solution, not have to wait every five years for a new plan. We evolved as an innovation service out of transport. Um, we focus, we've built out from transport and now cover areas such as energy and public health and social care as well. So we're sort of an innovation service for the whole council. But our first area of success came with um, connected autonomous vehicles. Um, we knew that we uh, had an opportunity in Oxfordshire um, to build that, work with the universities and the emerging industry. And so we, uh, we've, we've built out from some of the projects and there I will uh, touch on them uh, in a minute. I just wanted to, um, this is one of the areas that I get asked a lot. So innovation, proper innovate R&D innovation is not common in local government. I would, I've been doing it for seven years now and I thought by now there would be more of it, but it's still questioned within quite often at a high officer level. So quite often corporate management um, and sometimes members as well. Um, but we find from industry that they want us involved. And these are some of the reasons why, you know, we've, we've seen that the adoption rate of technology is happening um, quicker than ever. Um, so we need to be involved as a council to understand what the future may look like and what that, um, what might happen in terms of our policy directions to enable that for a good thing for our communities or, or, or manage the, the, the negative aspects of that. Um, but local authorities are interesting from the commercial side because we're one of the few organizations that deal in everything from the here and now, the emergencies, incident management, all the way down to decades planning, future planning. So there's almost something for everyone to get involved in and influence. Um, and why transport is really important um, is because we're at that point of change. So you can see the pictures at the top right there. They're just pictures, you know, that's between 1900 and 1920 was the last big change in terms of um, transport, moving from horse and carts into cars. And that's the picture of the center of Oxford. Um, and we're in a similar situation now where there's a fundamental change, which also then, as you can see from this, it has actually has a big impact on the way a place works and looks like. And there are lots of big decisions to be made about what we may want our places to look like. So as I said, we were very successful early on with connected autonomous vehicles. Our policy has always been that if we open up Oxfordshire for testing, working with emerging sectors, um, uh, um, this could allow us both to help start to solve some of our problems as a council, give us foresight, but also build up um, new economies and new sectors. And cabs probably are poster child for that. Um, it's evolved into more areas, connected infrastructure particularly. We also have a, um, a UAV team as well now. So we're doing increasingly work for um, unmanned flight um, and things like electric vehicle infrastructure, looking at um, the business case for that. So it evolved, it's, it's, it's moved across many more areas than CAV itself. But I think CAV was the first area where we won a project. Um, and that was with Driven, which is the video running at the moment, top right corner. That was with Oxbotic, who was spin out of Oxford University and a number of other partners, including the likes of TRL, for instance. Um, that, gave, that delivered our first constant testing of autonomous vehicles on the streets of Oxford. So there's been a, autonomous vehicles using Oxford and Oxford Shear roads for testing for about six years now, driven was about four years ago. And since that point, we've had ongoing testing um, regularly throughout the year uh, by Oxbotica. Um, more recently, um, in the last four, four or five years, we've also had a rival that are based in Oxfordshire. Um, they're starting to do some more autonomous testing, uh, looking at expanding that to the road. Um, they also have Robo Race, that is not on Oxfordshire. Um, that's some of the testing, that's the autonomous um, uh, motor racing um, that goes alongside the Formula E uh, competition. 
Um, and, but we've also got Street Drone, who are a local developed uh, company. They're sort of a, a non-university spin-out, which is a bit unusual for Oxfordshire. Um, they have developed uh, a platform which is looking at providing low-cost autonomous vehicles uh, to research facilities. And they've now recently been invested in by Wilkinson's, who are a retail group, to develop a, a low-cost um, uh, an autonomous delivery system and they hope to get that out on the streets in the next um, three to five years but all of this work for us um, why it's been important to prove it out back to our members is that um, across Oxford now we, we think there's approximately a thousand people employed in the in the connected and autonomous sector and that's companies like Oxford Street Drone Arrival but we've also got five uh, latent logic were brought up by Waymo um, and they put their headquarters for visioning technology into Oxford as well as part of that investment. And we've got a number of others. So there's probably about 15 different organisations, uh, including um, about three or four research groups connected to both Oxford University and Brooks. So it's it's an important, become a really important part of our economy quite quickly in maybe five years um, while still looking. Well, we're still just about on the verge now, looking at real solutions to some of our challenges, particularly things like freight. We think um, autonomy could be a big solution for last mile freight. Um, and Oxford's a perfect place to test that because that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, but so we start out with CAV, but one of the big areas that you get with CAV is you start to, well, our, our responsibility really is about understanding what's happening on the ground and how we manage that safely. So we uh, built up, uh, a sort of team that's really expert in uh, transport data and understanding um, how a city works from a transport perspective, and that includes modelling as well. Um, from all of this work, we realised that we needed a full view of everything that uses the network, and at the time we realised we had terrible information on cycling and walking. Um, so we went out to the market and uh, we found Vivasti Labs, who just recently done an Innovate project with Milton Keynes. I think we were the first people to buy Vivasti's um, solution in a commercial on a commercial basis. And this now gives us data for all modes that use all our corridors across Oxford. We now have 100 sensors around Oxford. And this is becoming increasingly important for both um, understanding how the, the city works from a transport perspective, but really understanding cycling and pedestrian, allowing us to plan much better for that, but also monitor the projects. Um, so we've moved on from just understanding getting this data to also looking at what we can do with different data sets. So we recently did a project uh, with Vivasti and Ford, um, and we looked at some of the data that we get from the Vivasti cameras. So you can see in the background here, this is swept path analysis that Vivasti shows at certain crossing points. Um, we combined that with data that we got from Ford, the connected data. Um, we had a, we had 150 to 200 volunteers um, who owned Ford cars that were, gave us data from their cars. And that looked at the, uh, using the sensors around the cars for proximity to cyclists. And this has given us a really unique and interesting data about where there's issues at key junction points. Um, uh, and that's primarily, so we, we're looking at where the possible safety issues where cars and cyclists are just um, getting too close together too often there's likely to be an accident that actually early set of data actually helped us design a new junction in the city center where we've restricted access to vehicles and made that much more friendly for cyclists and we're looking at how we can now take all that data to improve some of the designs around oxford and making it much more cycle friendly um, but what I wanted to point out here as well is it's not just about connected vehicles. We also did a really interesting project with a company called C-Sense. If you see there, um, the light that's up in the top uh, corner there, this is a connected light. Um, it provides us really unique data on everything from how bumpy the road is, um, if cyclists have to do a hard break, so it gives us indication of issues. So if that happens a lot, you can start to go out and investigate why they might be doing that. Uh, it might be at junction points and it gives us really detailed information about everywhere that cyclists actually use not where we think they use so we've started to bring that data together with other cycling data sets to start to give us a, a truly multi multimodal data set and i think that's really important for um for the future and how that combines with connected vehicles and also the policy decision we make of what our cities want to look like oxford is very much trying to reduce the amount of private cars 
Um, so we've got to make it as safe as possible for uh, cyclists to come into. Now, our next big challenge in Oxford is air quality. Um, we've had various air quality management areas that's been improved by uh, bringing in quite strict policies around air um, emissions. Um, only two weeks ago, we became one of the first authorities in the UK to put in a zero emission zone right for this very much the city centre, um, which will mean all of our public transport services will be moving over to electric very soon. Uh, and the ones going to the city centre have to do that. Um, and that zero emission zone is going to expand, we hope, to cover the whole of the city over time. Um, but we worked with an interesting project with um, Siemens and Ameson to look at whether we could combine air quality with traffic data and then manage the network in a way that um, reduced the impact from traffic um, on poor air quality. So we've got um, uh, uh, the A34 that runs around the edge of Oxford, which is um, a dual carriageway. So it's like a, a motorway that runs around the edge of Oxford. When something happens on that network, it usually causes chaos across Oxford because we don't have that many alternative routes. Um, so we uh, worked with Ainsent about gathering traffic data. So this is floating data. We put out new air quality sensors. We took uh, air um, predictive uh, information from MapAir and we took uh, data from uh, the highways agency as well, um, Highways England, and combined all that data in a, a new simulation model that then runs different scenarios for how we run uh, manage the network around the edge of Oxford into Oxford. Um, so all those different scenarios then look at the, the potential impact of an event or occurring, and it can then tell us the best way of managing that. So it doesn't take away the air quality, but what it does, it gives us the least worst outcome. Um, what was interesting, I think, really from this is by getting all these different types of data sets, um, particularly from the traffic point of view, we were able to have a pretty um, good level of predictive um, analytics for, tra for traffic impact. So we, um, we found with the Ameson's tool, we were able to get out to about 60 minutes ahead um, in terms of predicting the impact of traffic around Oxford when some an occurrence happened around Oxford. So that's become an important step for us to then integrate into how we manage the network uh, around Oxford. And again, as cars become more connected and autonomous, that you can see that these are the opportunities to automate this between traffic control centers and the cars themselves. Um, and then we can almost guide the cars um, around a city better, potentially, hopefully, without um, traffic lights themselves, looking far into the distance and reducing infrastructure on the road. So. This is a really interesting project that we're continuing to work with Ames to develop further and use for our scenario management um, on our networks in Oxfordshire. So that's it, really, that's sort of a little taste of some of the projects we do. We've, um, we've currently got, um, I think we've got six life projects across autonomous vehicles. That's looking at both modelling, um, on-road trials, we've got um, a new on-road trial connecting Didcot Parkway to Milton Park, a bit will start in the summer. Um, we've also enabled and supported Harwell to test um, a pod that goes around Harwell, uh, which is a business park um, on, on, on their own site. And we're working closely with Octobotica and Street Drone to help them to test and trial their freight solutions that are coming out soon. Um, but yeah, we so far we've, we've delivered 70 odd projects um, across the um, across the whole of Oxfordshire working with many partners and that's the team so if anyone wants to get in touch please do <clears throat> thanks very much Llewellyn um, I think if we get time we'll hopefully come back on some of the data issues that you've um, raised because I think that's going to be a big issue as we move forward. What can you get from the vehicle and what do you need from a vehicle um, as we think about this connectivity agenda? Um, I'm going to move quickly on to our last presentation to try and give us a bit of time in the um, in the panel session. So uh, our final presentation is from John Paddington, um, who you can probably see on your screen now. Um, uh, so John is from another authority in uh, in England, not far from Oxford. Um, he's from uh, the West Midlands, and I'll let John explain a bit more about where the West Midlands are and what the cities are that he he's involved with. Um, 
He's a, uh, a computer and software man. Um, uh, he has a degree uh, from the University of Warwick, which is a key kind of university in terms of the automotive sector in the UK. Um, prior to working at West Midlands, he worked in uh, a startup called Congenital um, uh, uh, and did a lot of work there over a long time. Um, uh, and prior to that, he was at Acom, which is one of the big transport consultancies in the UK. Um, uh, currently, he is also seconded part time to Ertico's innovation and deployment team, um, uh, where he's looking at 5G for cross border CCAM applications. Um, and such like. Um, I could tell you more, but it's probably best if I stop speaking and hand you over to uh, to John. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for the introduction. Oh, it was Canistal, by the way, but it's one of those names where it was, it was a clever <laughs> name. It's meant to be like Canistal combined, uh, but they yeah, never, no. never pronounce it. So, hey. There you go. Um, <laughs> Uh, first thing, I want to say thank you for inviting me to speak. And also, I, I was really impressed with the, the chat at the start. I think we pretty have almost every continent represented here. So it's really amazing to be able to talk to everyone all around the world. Um, I'm just going to go to my next slide because I think what Ian talked about was sort of the West Midlands. And I think I, I've deliberately chosen these slides to try and we're, we're doing similar but different things to Llewellyn. So I wanted to go for more of a, a customer person centric view of the world. Um, but to sort of give that background of our region, we're, we're very different from Oxford, Oxford here. Um, we're, we're primarily an urban region. So we represent two and a half million people centered around Birmingham, Coventry, Wolverhampton. Um, we are still probably the center of automotive production in the UK, but not as much as we previously were. Um, because historically we were always involved in automotive, um, we have quite car-centric road layouts. Um, a lot of people will associate our car city burning with concrete. Uh, and this picture here is Spaghetti Junction, which is probably one of the most famous landmarks of the city, which is um, both interesting from a sort of transport point of view, but slightly sad. But sometimes actually there's been a lot of work going on in our city. Um, but what we know is, is this. Um, one of the things that we're looking to do, and I wanted to cover this because I think it's important when we're thinking about applications of connected automated vehicles, and it ties back into the keynote speaks at the start, that we know we can't just do car centric anymore. It, it, it doesn't work. Um, we know the air quality issues, we know the safety issues, we know the congestion that we'll spend a lot of time building roads and it makes it harder and harder to increase capacity. So. What we're working on, and we, we have a what we call a local transport plan, which sets out for our region what we want to try and achieve over the next five years. And part of that is this kind of avoid, shift, improve mentality, which is a quite a common sort of approach for transport things. But effectively, what we want to encourage is to actually the people don't need to travel at all to start with. Can we cover economic growth, like remote working? Uh, better local environments that people don't need to actually travel. Um, but if they do travel, then can we actually make it better? So could we encourage walking, cycling, more uh, sustainable choices? And then so sort of at this bottom, this hierarchy is we know that not everyone will be able to change. And the, the car is an important part of our lives. Uh, freight is important. If we don't have freight, we don't get our food, we don't get our supplies business doesn't work so actually there's an element of we then have to do improvements and I think I'll come back to this towards the end as well because I think there's there's some interesting considerations on that and that influences what we're doing um, I, I'm not going to talk too much about our projects I wanted to focus more on what we're learning um, as I said we're doing similar things to Oxford here so I didn't really want to sort of duplicate uh, but one of the big things we've been working on is Midlands Future Ability so we have a collected Thomas Vehicles testbed um, we've been working on real world autonomous vehicle trials um, we have a lot of different infrastructure so we have things like CCTV um, IoT sensors um, we have a mixture of different uh, testing environments. So we have actual uh, Myra, which is one of the um, leading UK test uh, test environments located in our region. But we also have urban roads, uh, motorways, uh, rural roads. And we have a lot of the technologies you can see down below. 
Uh, one of the things that we've sort of defined, and I think this is where we come into harmonization, which is quite interesting, and it took some, some of the other points we've made before, but at different levels of autonomy, is how do you define operational domains? So this is an example of something we call sectors. So we div we divide our test bed into um, different areas um, and what we call a sector. So effectively identifying what, what's the key routes, um, what technology we have there, but also what's, what's, a, what's interesting about it. Um, if you wanted to do some testing or if you wanted to try a product or a service, um, what's there? So what's the speed limits? Um, what's the things that people want to actually use? So what do they want to go shopping? Do they want uh, the cycling? These kind of things. So um, this is one way we've been doing it. I think we're really interested to see how other people are doing it because actually these, these things as autonomous vehicles um, become more um, frequent, more rolled out, is actually important because then we need to know can the vehicle run autonomously in that area? Is the equipment there it's required? Um, Llewellyn mentioned about vastity sensors in his previous one. We've also, and my project I've just been running on is um, testing and deploying 290 vivacity sensors. Uh, one of the novel thing about our project is we've accompanied them with um, 5G routers. And the graph on the right is a normalized graph of latency. Um, from I think it's 55 of those sensors just from data this year. Um, and I've included this because I thought the ITE side of things might be interested in it particularly. Um, we are we are seeing a, a latency that changes through the time time of day. And it's not something we were expecting. Um, and that you'll see in the slide I've put in quotes 5G. So this is not without this is without a 5G core, but this is using what we expect to be fairly not a uh, fairly lowly used 5G, what's, what our mobile operators are providing, but it varies from 26 milliseconds, I think, to 64, um, depending, depending on time of day. And it's really interesting because some of the conversations we've had with the mobile networks, they define like edge and edge requirements that's less than 20 milliseconds. So it still shows that even where we think we've got 5G, we probably don't have it where, where we'd want to have it. And even that, that variation is quite a challenge because if you if you need that low latency and it, it works part of the time but not all the time, that's really difficult for some connected applications. Um, I, I put this some of my slides I put in there, they're a little bit um, let's say I, a bit of comedy in them, but I think that they're they're there to make some points. Um, you probably won't be able to read the thing on the left hand side, but it's something I came across on Twitter and it's a local restaurant basically had a complaint because someone went to the restaurant, um, drove for a bus lane and had a fine and basically complained to the restaurant saying, why, why didn't you not tell us about this and will you pay the, the fine? Now, obviously they won't pay the fine, uh, but the bus lane in question is on the right hand side. Now, it'd be, it'd be, and one of the things would be really interesting, if I could, I would ask everybody in the audience, do they understand what that actually means? But we were sort of forget that humans have trouble with understanding infrastructure and so things like signage rules of the road are different in different locations. So again, there's another area of harmonization here. How do we create common, common standards so that for instance, a, a UK developed size vehicle work in America and vice versa. So yeah, as I said, it's a little bit comedy, but I think it's an important point here. Um, and linked to that, one of the things we're trying to do is um, digitize our road network. We know that all these applications require data and you need good maps, you need good standards. So in the UK, what we have is something called traffic regulation orders. So they define like speed limits, parking restrictions, pretty much everything you need to know to practically operate a autonomous vehicle. One of the challenges we found is working with our councils is that all of these are often written in paper. Um, they'll be stored in a cupboard somewhere and just hidden away. And worse than that, the paper is often the legal requirement, but doesn't necessarily match the signs on the road. So if you actually follow the signs and then look at the paper, it can be different. So what we're trying to do and prepare ourselves for autonomous vehicles is to turn those into digital readable things. Uh, we're working with the UK government about different standards, et cetera, but it's hard work. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of time and requirements to sort of 
map everything, collect that data. We're trying to automate that where we can. Can we use sort of um, machine vision, other techniques to capture that data and reduce that kind of load? Um, then some of the points that we are, um, well, and some points is linked to this is also actually, there's, there's a lot of things that are really challenging for autonomous vehicles. And you'll find that if you get off actual um, publicly owned roads, private roads are a bit of a nightmare. And I, I, I use this as an example because this is something we looked at for a, a autonomous vehicle test, although we haven't actually done it yet. But this is a kind of a roundabout, but it's not, and it's got line markings, which are all very bizarre. Um, and actually, I think there's, there's a whole point. The, 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 we need to look at how do we, and this sort of ties back to the earlier presentations, about how do we make it easier for, for, for vehicles to navigate? Because I, I look at this as a, as a human, I'm quite a bit confused about where do I go? Do I go to, sort of to the, if I'm going straight on, do I go to the right? Or what does line markings mean? Who do I give way to? So, and this is important as well, because we will have automated and non-automated vehicles interacting. So if a human does something you're unexpected, the opposite of me is going to get really confused. Um, and again, continuing my theme of sort of slightly, slightly humorous slides, um, but this is something I came across on Twitter. Um, and you'll see that often people respond to Elon Musk with um, very interesting tweets. But basically someone said, oh, we can eliminate traffic lights. And you look at that picture and you go, mm, okay, actually that's good. Um, I'm not sure personally I would ever want to be in one of those cars because I think it'd be quite scary. But then the real challenge is if you've got that intersection, that junction, how do people cross the road? And this ties back to the point we made at the start. So our, our road network originally in the 60s was very um, car focused. Um, I've heard stories that our ring road was deliberately designed to not allow pedestrians to cross the road because unlike the US, we can't ban jaywalking. Um, so the, the, yeah, that, that comment I make about, well, if we digitize everything, do we remove humans? Well, yes, but realistically, no. Uh, and some of the things we've been looking at, and I think some of the projects I'm quite proud of for the region is some of our partners have been looking at how do humans interact? Um, and I've seen various different things about how can a pedestrian effectively exchange eye contact as they would do with a driver to know that the autonomous vehicle has seen them and is going to stop for them. But there's also a link to that is that people have different requirements and different understanding. So the, the picture on the right is how does a person with a guide dog who might have um, his sight is impaired, how do they interact? How do they how do they use a vehicle? Um, and so continuous theme of people, I think one of the things, and this is just a word of course, and, and I, I've worked in ITS since, since 2003 time. I, I, I love technology. I love what we can do with it. But we need to be realistic that it takes a long time for the technologies we're talking about to filter through to the general public. Um, and this is a slide. Uh, this slide shows some research we did over Christmas with one of our market research panels. It's not... Um, it's not necessarily a representative sample, so please be careful about that. But it's really interesting. So I, I didn't really know, and I wanted to find out, how do people navigate using um, in their cars? Um, and what's the different things that they use? And it's incredibly interesting that Google Maps has 80% of the market for people using navigation. And actually, sat-navs are like tiny now. There's only like 5% of people using sat-navs. Um, there's a bit of using Apple Maps and there's some other ones. So we, we do need to think about if we're developing connected technologies, these uh, better information that we can get that to what a lot of people use or we need to factor in that it's going to take time for people to have new cars with the built-in technologies, et cetera. Um, the other thing we've been looking at, and I think again ties into this theme, is, this, is an idea of personas. So we've divided our, our region into 14 different types of people. Um, you can see some of the stats we use on, on the slide. But this is this concept of that not everyone is the same. And if you talk, and I think this is one of the things I always think we need to learn more from the private sector. No company will treat all the customers the same. And we we often in the public sector think, oh, we'll just do one thing. 
but actually we've got lots of variation. So we divide our personas primarily on people's um, socioeconomic status, so how wealthy they are, how much they use public transport, and how many and how much they use cars. There's, there's other factors in it, but this is quite an important one. Um, and it's quite interesting because some of the research we've done ties into that. So, for instance, as a public as a local transport authority, often what we tend to use is we tend to have a public transport app. But if you if you talk to some of the personas that drive a lot, and that's the great target for a lot of the things we're talking about, they'll say we don't want to use a public transport app. We, we never use a public transport app. But go to information ways in Google, as I, as noted before, we'll use it. So we do need to think about how, why, what, and what are we targeting to get the most information there. Um, and linked to this is actually people travel and the ways of travel are really interesting and people have different things that, that enable them. And, and coming back to this avoid, sift, and prove, we've got to figure out what is the things that most uh, excite or interest people, make them change. And we've got all these different categories of what people want to think or what they want to do. And some people want to have a fun, fun and enjoyable journey um, and ties into sort of classic cars or sports cars. Some people want to be really safe. So if you're doing car example, you've got an SUV, SUV. Some like to socialize, some don't like to socialize. So actually there's all these points. And I think actually we can, there's a next stage from the technology and particularly with the automated vehicles is how do we create services that people really want to use? Um, and I think we're still we're still thinking about technology and we're not necessarily thinking about services. Um, and then, done. yeah, and linked and, and links this and one of the things that, so we're, we're an Ertico partner, as I, um, as I said, I'm also part-time as quantum Ertico, but actually we, one of the projects that really excites me that we've just won something called Symphonica. Um, this is a rising Europe funded one and it starts in the summer, but we're looking at user needs for collective autonomous vehicles, um, Part of the project is create decision support tool to share with the wider industry. But I think this is going to be great because this will really start getting into these kind of conversations about how do we move away from technology and how do we do things that people want to use and tie into actually the business cases. Uh, another project we've just started, and again, if I really welcome people reaching out to me on this one. Um, we're looking at in a pilot of the in-vehicle messaging. So we have north of Birmingham, we have um, two motorways, the M6 and the M6 toll. So the toll is a diversity route. We're looking at a, a test of using in-vehicle messaging technology to try and promote um, use of the toll road. This has come about because actually we had budget for it, for basically building infrastructure um, due to various reasons that didn't actually, we couldn't actually get the agreement around the infrastructure. So we said, well, let's do this electronically. And this is the thing we've been talking about for probably about 10 years in the industry on if we can prove that we can give information in vehicles, um, we don't necessarily need so much this infrastructure and it's a lot more sustainable, it's a lot more flexible. But then also the, I, I give the warning and I give back of what we said earlier, Lots of people are only using Google Maps. So we've got to work out how do we engage with some of these bigger organizations? How do we standardize? And also that what we do, we want to be common in the UK, um, but also across Europe and the world, because actually there will be people driving for, for across Europe using our roads. Um, our, um, our roads are, are strategic for the country. So often will be used by people bring freight movements up to Scotland or across to Wales. Um, there'll be people with different language requirements. So there's a, there's a, common understanding required here um, and then this is my final question which is I almost pose as like an exam question for the audience but it's the thing um, it, it ties into something we thought we started to think about one of my projects when I work as a startup but it's a question so and I don't think anyone's really talks about it um, so we all talk about shuttles so what would happen if you're waiting for an autonomous shuttle and free turn up at the same time how do you know which one you want to get into? And then the increasing challenge about this is if you're deaf or blind, how would you do it? And don't forget, this: in, if this isn't the, the real autonomous dreamland, we don't have anybody on board, so you can't even ask the person. Um, and again, this is another area where I think we will need some kind of common approaches for identification or common standards for apps so people can actually work out what the vehicle to use. And that's me. 
Great. Um, thanks very much, John. I'm just waiting for my video to come back on. Um, so you've you've helpfully left us with a question. Um, now, I, I guess that's a general question to the audience. Um, let me uh, let me invite the other uh, speakers to turn their camera on and join us again. I, I noticed in the Q and A. So, if anyone has a question, can you put it into the Q and A, please? Um, as the session has been uh, underway. A number of questions have come in and I'm grateful to our presenters for answering a number of those. Um, I'm trying to work out which ones haven't been answered, but let me just, let me, while I'm trying to work that out, let, let me take a bit of chairman's privilege here. And um, let me ask a general question because we've heard about 5G, a number of speak, people have spoken about 5G, but there is a, an issue and maybe I'm just being a little bit parochial and thinking about it from a, a UK and EU perspective, which is about redundancy. And and I hope that's the right word. But so, for example, the eCall system operates on 2G or maybe even 2G slash 3G. And I understand that that is progressively going to be turned off um, because obviously people are currently looking or using 4G and moving to 5G. But the issue, if I'm just being um, parochial and thinking about the UK, by the end of this decade, we will probably have 15 million vehicles in the UK alone operating on 2G eCall. That won't work any longer. So, so how do we ensure that automated systems or highly automated, etc., doesn't suffer the same problem that after a number of years, the system just simply doesn't work because the infrastructure is no longer provided. So that's a very general question. And uh, I can see Just has got his hands up, but maybe Maria Christina might have some views as well. Thank you. Hello, ladies first. Or should I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you had your hand up. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> okay. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Maria Christina. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a particular interesting question because it's about technology neutrality versus uh, technology regulation versus uh, compatibility and interoperability of technologies. Yeah, And that's what I mentioned in my speech in the beginning. Um, if you have a legacy fleet, and we take cars in this case, um, in Europe, I don't know about other regions, but in Europe, we are quite unique in regulating e-call through a, um, I would say, a Parliament Council Act and then delegated and implementing acts which mandates an eCall system in, I would say, type one vehicles and one vehicles. Uh, so passenger cars and light commercial vehicles as from, I think, April, 2018. Um, and that uh, regulation is specifically describing what kind of minimum data should be sent to the 112 services, but also what kind of technology should be used. So this regulation is not technology neutral. It actually specifies that it should be done through um, circuit switched um, uh, networks at that time it was 2g 3g today we have 5g and tomorrow 6g and whatever um, the issue is indeed when you regulate these things in terms of technology um, after three years four years you're already late uh, you're already out of, of business and indeed we've 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 now the situation that mobile network operators rightfully or not that's not my my thing but they want to switch off 2g 3G and or 3G, with the consequence that not only connected vehicles for e-call will be out of service in terms of uh, reaching the 112, but probably some other things as well, like smart meters, like uh, other devices that may be the bank terminals, etc. So we are one of the only industries that have been regulated to use these 2G, 3G inbound modems. What we asked to the European Commission with the manufacturers and also article is, well, please, um, stop the bleeding, quote unquote, meaning do not ask us to put vehicles on the market with older technology because it's a mandate. Yeah? And secondly, I try to be technology neutral in terms of allow the manufacturers and the service providers to choose the technology they need and maybe have it interoperability at a service level, but not at a technical, I would say, infrastructure level. That's up to, it's actually at a service level that, that we have to talk the same language and to be interoperable. Yeah. It's a bit like exchanging data sets. Um, it's not regulating the data sets, the minimum data sets, but actually the taxonomy of the metadata that should be regulated and maybe standardized. Um, and, and that's the problem with cooperative technologies, cooperative systems. You need to talk to each other 
and it's like CITS and the more you talk to better, the better, but everybody needs to talk the same language. And in Europe, you're now a bit stuck with the eco as one of the examples. Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, yes. I don't know. I, I, I suggested Maria Christina. I don't know whether you have anything to say on this. Um, uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And indeed, I agree with uh, what's said by just because uh, uh, when drafting the ADS regulation, we try to uh, keep this uh, principle of technology neutrality in mind. So we refrain to go over too much into details uh, because we wanted to cover not only the technologies available today or uh, uh, upcoming to the market, but also what might be de developed further in the future. And we cannot see uh, everything that is coming. Uh, so we wanted to stay as general as possible. Still, we needed to um, add some specific technical requirements uh, for type approval, but with the principle of of technology neutrality. I think this is uh, fundamental to ensure that indeed uh, we are not uh, uh, preventing innovation. <laughs> and uh, another aspect is uh, also that of standardization. So we can we can somehow prevent at least at some level um, that uh, new technologies will not be interoperable with what we have in the past if we think about um, a standardized approach. Uh, for example, we were discussing in the motor vehicle working group uh, how to deal with the technology uh, changing in sensors, how to deal with the requirements, what if sensors need to be changed or are no more produced, so do we need to undergo to, through type approval again, and of course here the answer could be if we can set uh, standardized performance requirements then this would not be needed. So these sensors can be changed, for example, with equivalent ones and so on and so forth. I understand that with the examples that uh, you brought, it could be a bit more uh, difficult to, to find this uh, kind of uh, interoperable solutions. But I think that we will also have to learn to be more flexible on the regulatory side. Mm. So. Good, okay, um, thank you. I, I noticed we've got a question now in our... Um in our chat bar or a question answer bar rather, which is from Stein Helga Mundal, um, which is basically picking up, I think, on the point made by our last two presenters. Um, and it reads, now, after testing autonomous vehicles in road traffic for three to five years, is now the conclusion that the infrastructure must be prepared and simplified for these vehicles in order to get them to operate. And I, I think uh, uh, John and maybe Llewellyn um, might have a view on that, and maybe Dino as well, because you're all talking about this infrastructure question um, rather than the vehicle side. So I don't know whether um, John or Llewellyn or Dino want to pick up on that question. I, mean, I can give a perspective from... Okay, thanks. I mean, the main issue seems to be, so, so yes and no, which is always confusing. <laughs> I think um, what we're getting back from industry is if it's a lower speed, then the vehicle process can sort of deal with a lot of things. So we have, we're just taking a policy to have a 20 mile an hour speed limit across the whole of the city. Um, that's primarily for safety and cycling, but actually is enabling some of the freight, last mile freight, autonomous freight solutions, because they are confident that they can they can work in that environment. That, that what they're looking at doing, though, are restricting certain areas. So it's more, it's as much about the mapping of the city and the spaces and zones that it would work within. Um, so they'll restrict themselves. I think as you get to a higher speed, you need a very consistent infrastructure um, for the vehicles to work safely in at the moment. And, and that's so that's our experience. We, there seems to be a clear delineation between low speed urban to it's particularly the um it's particularly this it's not even the motorways because that becomes quite um consistent in terms of infrastructure it's the roads in between okay let, 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 let me bring dino in i don't know dino how you get on with your high speed routes and then and maybe john afterwards this is a great conversation um you know the three odds that we're focusing in on our, our highway i think at lewin what we what we call the the middle uh, connectors are arterials and then the dense urban 
from our perspective, we believe that the highways are probably the simplest of the three ODDs, um, just because of the uh, minimal amount of uh, outside road actors that are inter, you know, interacting in that environment. And you know, fundamentally, I do believe that the challenge to date with the L4s and, and beyond are this, the long tail of edge cases that it's very difficult to try to train these vehicles to anticipate every situation. And so that's kind of part of our value proposition is the fact that we can, A, simplify the ODD with consistency and simplification of the environment, but then also help reduce those that tail of edge cases, right? And take some of the lifting off the vehicle and give them the information that I think that they need to be able to operate safely and efficiently. But I do believe it depends on your ODD because the dense urban by far and away has probably some of the biggest challenges, albeit lower speed, but far more uh, complexity in the environment between the, the road actors and the pedestrians and um, the traffic um, and the amount of the density of the vehicles. So there's, uh, there's pros and cons of each ODD. And I think there's a play for infrastructure to help vehicles in all three of those for different reasons. You know, and, and then in the highway, you know, the, the fact that we're talking, it's simpler for it's a more simpler, uh, simple environment. But when you talk about trucks, as an example, at the speeds that they're operating, our ability to tell them what's well beyond their v field of view is very important because of the, the braking distance that they need to be able to make a decision and alter their planning um, path, whether it's to change a lane because there is a foreign object in the road a half a mile down that they can't see in the current lane that they're in, or if there's a vehicle that's stopped on the side of the road. So um, I think Ian, that, that there's, there's definitely a play for infrastructure to help these vehicles operate more efficiently when it comes to the edge cases, because it is a long, long tail. Right. Um, and I think what, what you just said, of course, is consistent with the uh, ALKS regulation that we adopted mm -hmm. in, in the vehicle regulatory team, WP29. Um, last year, where it, where it only allows that automated lane keep system to operate in, in highway, motorway, autobahn type operations, uh, where there is traffic going in a single direction without a fixed barrier between it. Um, so, John, you, you, you said, you know, can automation take over from where people can't work out what the road signs should say? What do you think? Well, I, th I think... One of the things for simplification is to deal with people because actually uh, it's this weird one. I live in the centre of Birmingham and since we had our lockdown, the amount of people driving down the wrong way in roads is really interesting because I think people have got used to less traffic and think they can get away with more things. So actually simplifying infrastructure helps not having other non-drivers car or drivered cars um, and not do stupid things. But I think it comes down to sort of, I suppose it's, it's disengagement rates really, because this is what, what we're really talking about is can the vehicle handle the, 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 the network and how often does it need a helping hand? And I think if you look at a lot of the shuttle providers, there's a lot of, talk now about using 5G as remote control because everyone's realized that it's not the vehicle isn't going to be able to find its way around. So there's a balance here between of can you simplify the infrastructure or do you provide things like 5G or CV2X communications and these other technologies to help provide help it. So I I don't think there's a, there's a one answer fits all for this. It all really comes down to what the rollouts are and I think I don't know what's like the rest, rest of the world but here in the UK our road right layouts vary immensely uh, even when they're meant to be designed to standards because they'll be built at different times different periods okay thank, thanks John Mar Maria Christina thank you thank you Ian indeed I would agree with what uh, said by Dino before in the sense that Rather than saying we should simplify the infrastructure, I would say infrastructure can support automatic vehicles. And especially for what concerns their anticipatory behavior. So, you know, we have discussed a lot about that also during the ALKS regulation drafting. 
And so there will be, for example, limitations in how far the DS vehicle can see with the sensors on board. But thanks to communication with the infrastructure or with the other vehicles or connectivity, so uh, whatever other strategies, it will be able to look forward and adopt this anticipatory behavior that is typical of human drivers as well. So if you see a, a, a queue uh, uh, along the way before you, you will start decelerating, you will not wait the very last meters and perform an emergency braking. So that's the concept. And uh, again, infrastructure can support with connectivity, driving automation, for example, in use cases like the automated valid parking in closed environments. So part of the sensors will be indeed in the infrastructure, helping the ADS to see uh, what it doesn't see. Uh, for example, after a ramp or behind the corner and to advise uh, how, how to drive if there are obstacles. And um, again, something that I, I also would like to mention is that rather than simplifying the infrastructure, what I see happening is that the ODD, so the operational design domain of the use cases coming to the market is maybe simplified because as Dino mentioned, the easiest probably was the uh, motorway application, and that's where we start from. So level three uh, motorway application with the LKS regulation, uh, so that in case, uh, for example, the ADS encounters difficult situations it is not able to handle, uh, it, it can still hand over to the driver. And then with level four applications, we are uh, moving towards the urban environment, which is of higher complexity, but uh, still with some uh, uh, like reduced complexity. And in, so with some simplification, for example, uh, shuttles or robotaxi will uh, uh, run on uh, uh, the base of geofenced uh, path. So where they know, they, they will know exactly the, the operational design domain and that's where they will uh, function. Um, so that, that would be my comment. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good. Thanks very much. Um, okay, um, now that I, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, that has gone a long way to answering the question that was posed in the Q&A. Um, I did want to come back to another one that um, I think uh, John has already answered from uh, Hamid Zatari concerning latency numbers, etc. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but, but the question I had was more about data reliability and connectivity, connection reliability, because some of the issues that we're talking about rely on a good connection to the system, whatever the system is, so that the vehicle knows where it is, the operator knows where it is, whether it's an automated vehicle being used by a remote operator or to deal with some of the urban environment stuff. And, you, you know, years ago when I was doing environmental technical standards, we talked about the canyon effect um, because that was an issue for airflow and such like through cities. But the same issue arises again here with the ability to communicate. So how are we going to solve that? Is 5G good enough to solve that? And, and I'm hoping this might prompt more questions from our experts in the ITU that know all about data and canyons and reliability and such like, but I don't know whether any of our speakers today have a view on that. Um, I, I can start. Um, so a lot of the 5G we've been looking at is for sensors. Um, there's, we, we, to be honest, we've only started to use use the data. So I think I have plotted that graph, and I, I put it deliberately to provoke a discussion. Let's say to say it's the answer. Um, we're still trying to capture some data. I think the there's some interesting things, and I think we're probably looking at we're needing to move away from sort of the public mobile network operator approach. And one thing we found is that. A lot of the, the applications we're looking at are about uploads. It's more important than downloads, uh, especially if you get, you've got two-way communication to get the public networks prioritize download speed. So you often get it. Um, the ratio between upload and download is actually very focused on the download. So I think that there's that, that element is one. Um, there, there is some, we, we found some interesting quirks and when we first started we were really hard we found it really difficult to get out of 5g equipment um 
but we, we we ended up with some of our sensor radios were, were stopped working at half six in the evening. Um, but we found out that's because they were trying to do a software update. The software update had been scheduled for 2 a.m. Chinese time. So that there's, I think there's a lot of practical, it's not just the data standards, but it's these practical real world questions. Um, so I think we still, we're still needing to find out. And I think we probably are moving, we will need the full 5G cores if we really want the, 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 the low latency communications. But I've had different conversations from different suppliers. Some say you do need it for remote, remote driving. Others say we don't. We don't. Um, and there's a lot of range because actually I think 4G on a very good day is fine. But most of the time it's not that good because there, there's this demand if we're using public networks, et cetera. I'm going to let other people know a lot more coming, I think. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not a, a, a communications guy, so I don't know. Uh, does anyone else have a view? What about our, um, our participants, our delegates who are joined the session? So I'm sure someone there knows the answer about whether 5G is good enough and whether Canyon effect uh, applies. Um, or, or Llewellyn, you, you must deal with these kinds of issues in Oxford. Yeah, we've um, so we have major canyon in problems. We, we just have major mobility, mo mobile connectivity problems because of uh, the universities made a decision quite a while ago to not allow mobile phone masts on the land, which is a bit of an issue actually when they own half the city. Um, so they have changed their mind recently, but it's slow. We're building, we're still recovering. Um, what we're looking at doing at the moment, we just um, we're using. Um, our street furniture um, under a single supplier approach. So we've, I think we've just agreed our first five lamp columns for a multi-supplier, which is really boring, it sounds, but it's quite important. So we're hoping that enables us to get um, connectivity into all of Oxford um, and importantly down some of the areas where you do get the canyon effect, because it, it even affects simple things like real-time bus information. You just you get 30 seconds of route that goes offline um because it can't send the signal back so that's even the basic things we can't get right yeah without with this so we're learning a lot from that we've also got a trial across the um the county it's a horizon 2020 project um that we're part of where we're testing uh 5g and cal and it's that's more about almost throwing data out to work out what we want to get back from a connected and autonomous vehicle um, to look at what we would need in terms of um, safety aspects, traffic management aspects as well. Um, and again, so we've used uh, our infrastructure, um, our streetlight columns around the county to um, put that. So there's a route effectively around Oxfordshire that's connected um, and that's enabling us to build a digital twin as well. So we're, Whistling really in the early phases. My, my, my worry for if CAV requires infrastructure to make it work, then it's a, we're a long way off it happening because anything that requires infrastructure, and certainly if it requires the government to do anything about infrastructure, then we're a really long way off doing it. <laughs> it's a surefire way to failure, is if it requires the government to deliver something major to make yeah. something work. So um, I, I, I think. I'd hope that there's a solution that's sort of an infill um, and there's a commercial investment side we'll bring with it. And our job, I think, from government, from the highest up to the bottom, is to enable that to happen safely and for the benefit of communities, um, but maybe not be too spe technically specific. Okay, well, as a, as a government employee, I'm, I'm not going to respond to your to your observations uh, for fear of uh, my, my, my employment. <laughs> um, no, I don't know, uh, Dino, you know, how do you get on with these things? Um, you know, the, the picture you showed was of a nice clear road, um, you know, rolling hillsides and such like. Is this not an issue for you at all? So just to confirm, you, it's specific to the, on the latency side or on the communication well, piece as a whole? It's just, yeah, how do, you, how do you ensure that comms from your pod? I think you talked about 200 mm -hmm. meter intervals. Yep. That's quite a long distance. There'll be a lot of things in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, you know, for us, it's, I see, we see three primary channels to communicate to vehicles and, and to humans because there is information we're collecting that we believe will help all users of the road. 
And one of the things that you may or may not have seen in the presentation was a digital sign that was along the roadway as well. Uh, what's nice about the digital sign is it not only A, communicates with uh, humans, important information about what's ahead, but it also can communicate to vehicles as well through the forward facing cameras. So there would be a more of a near term means to communicate with vehicles right now. Um, obviously low latency information, safety critical, functional safety information clearly needs to be low latency. And that's where we're working with our OEM partners in the US to better understand their deployment strategies when it comes to CVIDX and DSRC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I think the higher latency information, whether it's construction zone changes, uh, weather information or things of that nature, clearly higher latency can be handled through an API cloud to cloud. So I think Ian, it comes down to the type of information that we're collecting and more importantly providing and the, the you know, how, how safety critical is it? So we have you know, established, I think different time horizons for those pieces of information and those messages and what is the best channel to communicate that to the vehicles with. Right, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I think that's probably, um, unless Maria Christina wants to say anything on it, um, uh, I think maybe we've exhausted that particular question. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm not, I'm not a communications expert. I mean, I think, I think a, 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 a person, you know, an innocent bystander, so to speak, might draw a conclusion from this conversation that that led them to conclude that automation, highly automated, etc., was something for the highway, motorway, autobahn, whatever you want to call them, rather than for urban, because the conversation has been such that the the open open highway kind of thing should be okay, where you've got urban city very densely packed, you've got high risk even though the vehicles are moving at slow speed you've got a lot of pedestrians a lot of issues that's really really challenging to have a consistent approach continuously um is what i think a, a, a an, an you know an innocent bystander type of person might might conclude but do you think i've i've wrongly reflected that view anyone got a thought on that I think that's about right, but I would say it, this requires really consistent investment. Because if you go to drive down our motorways at the moment, there are plenty of blackouts where I drive back to Wales regularly, and I can I can tell you the bits of a road road where I, I don't have any connectivity, and it's the same for even our railways. And these aren't these aren't areas where you know we know exactly where they're going and where and what the requirements are, but we're still quite far behind. that's that's my main i do I, I agree i think that's the principle but then we've got to commit to that for 15 to 20 years and, and maybe highways the highways agencies of our nations need to also include connectivity um, as a key deliverable rather than new roads even because it's also linked to climate um, as well so maybe that's a, there's a sort of change in whole scope of what they're doing um, you know so it, there's i think yeah, I think you're right, but it, it's a big ask when we still haven't done the basics in, across the UK, definitely. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Um, I don't know, Just, I don't know if you're still with us. I don't know, given that you're the kind of European overseers in Ertico, do you have any thoughts on this notion of reliable connectivity in urban areas? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a number of trials going on with European funded projects on this. Um, now, what we what we do, for example, is on CRTS, um, we had the project uh, dealing with compatibility of technologies. We talked about the eco thing. Um, this was about compatibility. It's Concorda. That's the name of the European funded project. It was about um, ITS G5 versus or and I have to say and uh, 4G, 5G. Or CV2X in the in the cellular mode, not the short range mode, and um, we found out that of course these technologies they do not talk to each other at the technical level, but at the functional level there was indeed a compatibility and interoperability. Um, in city environments, uh, we also now trialing with um, the digital twins on the physical layout, physical environment, how to get these HD maps of the OEMs updated in a constantly. Um, another thing that is a bit more worrying is the cross border um, aspect. 
in terms of uh, mobile connectivity. Uh, we're not yet there. A lot of countries still have 4G active, live. Um, and there are also black spots, especially on the highways uh, in the rural areas, where we see when you have a car in automated motors, for example, going from one country to another, reaching the border, that it takes sometimes a minute, even a maximum a minute, to, to find a new network, to roam on the new network uh, in the other country. Now, if you have safety-related applications and you depend on connectivity for that, that is, of course, a big issue that you have. So that, that is something we test and trial with 5G uh, in the Mobix and in many other projects. Um, but it's a, it's a constant concern that we still have and that we have to solve with our telecommunication friends, of course, yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, well, I, I think I'm just going to kind of wrap up on that particular theme. Um, I, I'd now like to sort of move completely left field or however you want to talk, because something which has been an issue, which I, I'm pleased that Maria Christina raised in her presentation, was this issue, and this is a vehicles thing, so forgive me the telecoms people and data people but this is a vehicles question. You raised in your presentation the, the question of training and, and the capability, which, which is what I drew from your point, is the capability of the, uh, the testing authorities, such as in Europe, the type approval authorities. And of course, that T type approval authority is still something in the UNECE. It's not, it's not just about the uh, EU. Um, and where they're dealing specifically with some of these advanced technologies and data protocols, et cetera, um, and, and cybersecurity and software, et cetera, have been the first regulations with this kind of issue. Um, how do you see that moving forward? And, and you know, how do we make sure that the type approval system, how, we've all got the confidence in the type approval system that we need um, uh, going forward? I don't know whether, yeah, maybe that's, I don't know, Maria, Christina, what, what's the EU's view? Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for this interesting question. Indeed, uh, we have been discussing that. And for, uh, for example, for the audit of the safety management system, we indicated, and, and also for the safety assessment of the design and validation process, we indicated some um, uh, indeed competencies uh, of the auditors. So this can be a, a bit more clear part. For the rest, as I mentioned in the presentation, we expect to work on the guidelines to uh, develop new competence or consolidate existing competencies, and especially on the interpretation of the regulation. So I think that further work will be needed to, to reach um, uh, that the same understanding is uh, spread across the authorities. How, how do you see that? You know, clearly and understandably, you're looking at this from an EU point of view, but of course you rely on the UNEC regulations, which has got a much broader um, uh, um, support. You know, 50, 50 odd countries adopt the UN regs. You've got 27 in the EU. How do you make sure that you overlay, overlay those two approaches? Well, actually, um, as I also mentioned, we are uh, totally aligned with the um, processes uh, uh, being drafted and proposed uh, in UNEC, also because we take part in the discussion. So we do not only follow the discussion, as you might know, we, we are also contributing actively, making proposals and also leading subgroups. Um, so indeed, we, we, are, we are sure that we are pretty much in line <laughs> because we are doing the, the, the same concepts developed in UNEC. We are also uh, following them in uh, EU discussion tables. Good, good. Okay. I don't know whether anyone else has got any observations of our presenters on training and skill sets in the authorities that are assessing vehicles or systems. Well, that's also because not all the authorities uh, will have the same level of expertise or of uh, competencies. So some of the authorities will probably never be asked to type approval <laughs> uh, or uh, will not have to face that anytime soon. Other authorities will have more than one opportunity to type approval and automate a driving system. So we also think that it will be very important coordination among the authorities, among the member states, to, to share their expertise and their learnings. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think that's a very sensible approach. Um, 
Okay, so I don't know. No one else, none of our other presenters wish to uh, enter the discussion on uh, on training and such like. So, um, I think for our last discussion time, we're getting towards the end of our, our whole session now. I'm, I'm minded to go back to John, the, the final slide. He had a question, which is um, in that uh, autonomous pods. Um, so, John, do you want to tell us the question again? I think I bring my slide up and I need to be, but uh, yes, yeah, something like we're rightly f focusing a lot on sort of the mechanics of autonomous vehicles. So how do we make it automated? How does it drive? Um, there's lots of things, and this is probably one of the questions, like there's practical things that when people interact with them, how, how will they interact with it? So the question I was asking and was how would you know if you've got a group of pods which one is yours and specifically if you have blind or partially sighted um or blind or partially sighted or hearing or other impairments how would you do that do you want me to start with my thoughts and then the other presenters can sort of come into that yeah go, go for it yeah so and arguably it's similar to what is the claim question you have at the moment with buses or something. So if you're going to get a bus, you might have multiple buses at the same bus stop. So, you, but these are probably going to be smaller vehicles. So you probably need something either on the vehicle or an app to guide you there. But then you, you, it's, it's starting with this is, is how, how, do, how and, and there's a relate, there's an even more related question to it is how do you get into the pod once you've found it? But, uh, it will be interesting to see what other people think about this. And is this something we need to standardise? Do we just rely on suppliers? It's, it's, it's deliberately designed to be an open question. Good, good. Okay, look, I'm going to give I'm going to give each, each of our presenters a minute each, and then that gives me a couple of minutes to sum up. So um, let's go let's go with Llewellyn next, and, right. then, and um, then Dino. I just keep it as simple as possible. Use use the trusty lamp columns. <laughs> but I, I do think you need wayfinders of where you where you have to stand for it to come. But I mean, I just assume you could have voice activation. You could even say your name, couldn't it? Um, when it arrives, I mean, I, I, don't, I think. How does that work? How does that work with someone who's deaf? Well, then I, I think that's where you'd have to look at an electronic device um, that would have to help um, indicate to them where their pod is. But it is trickier for certain people. I would say if you're going to use, interesting thing we found out on a separate project, um, that um, most buses are done with black on uh, uh, orange on black. And we were doing a project for people with early onset dementia. And that often comes with difficulties with sight. And uh, it, it's really common that orange on black is pretty much the most, it's the hardest thing to read. So we were finding with people with, early onset dementia and some other um, diseases such as early onset Alzheimer's and things. Um, one of the reasons they didn't want to use buses anymore is because they couldn't read the bus number on the buses. So there's, this, there's loads of things you have to go into. John's so right on that. Good. So, right. I'm, I'm going to cut a guillotine. That's it. Sure. I'm going to move on. So <laughs> Dean, Dino next and then just after that and then Maria Christina last. Thank you. Dino. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we've talked a lot about infrastructure and vehicles, but you know, I think ultimately we would all agree it really starts with the most vulnerable person, and that is probably the pedestrian and, and working outward from there, uh, it's particularly in dense urban. A lot of opportunities for, you know, individuals to perhaps go astray or to go where they shouldn't. I think it, uh, honest, you know, honestly, it begs for a UX, ex, you know, engagement exercise, a, a journey map of sorts where you can, ex, you know, immerse yourself in that individual's day to day and their journey from whether it's their home or a doctor's office to a bus stop. And then ultimately to John's point into a pod. I don't know that I have the answer, but I think there's definitely opportunities to exercise some proven tools and techniques to try to make the right decisions as to how to enable that experience to be as safe and as uh, pleasant as possible for that individual. Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks. Just any thoughts? Yeah, we've been thinking about this also. Um, when we discuss the ALTS, when you have the acoustic signals and the other signals that you have to give for the minimum risk monitor, when things derail or literally derail. Um, and I give you another example of a recent environment um, on trip platooning. Um, we showcased our final event last week with the commission. 
And actually, there was a question from the audience, uh, a driver, how will I know that a truck is in platooning modus yeah, on the highway, mostly? So how will a automated convoy let know to the others that they are automated so that there, there cannot be a cut through, etc.? cetera? And, and that's why the question for standardization probably, or at least some synchronization. It, I know in Japan, they use a kind of uh, light um, uh, signal on the vehicle. Probably for the pots, it would be the same if they are in automated mode. I don't know what kind of signals they, they transmit. Um, and definitely Bluetooth or near field communication technologies would work on this one, I guess, uh, especially for the pot environment, which are not supposed to be far away. So, uh, but again, a, a good question for harmonization and standardization on how to signal, literally signal to the, to the others um, that something is automated and connected. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that thing about, it's not just about the technology, it's about the people that are going to use it. Um, yes. And right. that's, that's the key to this yeah. question. So, so Maria Christina, any, any thoughts on this question? Thank you. Well, yes, indeed, this is a very interesting topic. And it is also somehow under discussion at the FRAV informal working group. Uh, so the working group uh, uh, developing functional requirements for automated vehicles. Uh, there is um, a user's work stream and indeed, usability and acceptability requirements are being discussed uh, because indeed also having to interact with the normal users, uh, but also with the impaired users is something that should be taken into account to ensure that automated vehicles are usable by anyone. And the example uh, brought here by John is uh, very clear, but for example, also boarding and uh, of boarding the, the shuttles, so, or the robot taxi. So I think more work is needed on these aspects and at least some level of standardization or requirements will need to be developed on that. Okay, that, I, that brings us in very, very nicely on, on the time to draw our session to a conclusion. Um, let me, on behalf of everyone who joined our session, we had under, about 140 people, I think, uh, this afternoon, variously. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think our speakers have been excellent. You brought a broad range of experiences and ideas and thoughts to the work that is clearly very, very important and will continue to be so because we're now shaping the transport infrastructure for the next decades. Yeah, you know, this is a real kind of fundamental shift in transport from what we've known for the last 120 years to something quite different. And it's really, really important that we're having these open, friendly discussions about some of the challenges we face. So let me, on behalf of everyone that joined our session today, thank you for contributing in the way that you have. Um, let me also thank uh, Gifty and Stefano from the ITU uh, for their excellent organisation and shepherding myself and the presenters with our presentations and all the information that we've needed. As always, they've done an excellent job. And then lastly, let me thank Francois Guichard and Melissa Archer from the UNECE, um, from, from the UNECE side as well. Um, and that draws us to a conclusion. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the ITU uh, Future Network car event. I think it starts again tomorrow morning, um, but uh, look on the website and make sure you make sure you register. That was the message I took from this morning's session. Oh, sorry, the introductory session. You have to register. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, it's been a great session, as always. Um, and uh, yeah, um, see you all soon, I hope. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thank you very much, Jan, as well. Thank you very much for moderating this session one. Thanks uh, to all the panelists. So this is Stefano Polidori from the ITU. I also wish to invite everyone to join tomorrow. And I also want to join uh, Jan to thank uh, Francois Guichard and uh, Walter Nisler that uh, have facilitated the uh, organization of the session of today. Tomorrow we have another uh, very interesting session. Uh, it will be moderated by a good uh, friend of the symposium, that is Mr. Michael Sena. It's on artificial general intelligence applied to vehicle safety services and transport management. I'm sure that will be a very interesting session. So I also wish to recommend everyone to register and join tomorrow. So thank you all, see you tomorrow. And I hope you have enjoyed uh, the symposium today uh, with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.